Blank check with Griffin and David. Blank check with Griffin and David. Don't know what to say or to expect. All you need to know is that the name of the show is Blank Check. Hi. I've got a podcast I want to play. Everyone is trying to get to the pod. The name of the pod. The pod is called Blank Check. Oh, Blank Check. Blank Check is a place. A place where nothing, nothing ever happens. I didn't change any of the words for that part. No, but it's true. Yeah. On target. Very, very I also said it's a place. (laughs) Yes, I thought you were going to go. me a podcast. Blank check is a pod. I was like, nah, I can't do pod again. I can't do podcast. Mm. You know what? Of course, we all know. As Thor told us. Mm -hmm. Oh, blank check is a. People not a podcast. I don't know. I don't even know <laughs> well, what you're saying. Asgard is a people not a place. Then, right, right. I was like, right. too many Bla- Thor quotes. Blank check is a place, not a podcast. Mm. That's my fuzzy math. Yeah, mm. yeah. I think that's stupid. I, I think, think blank check is a feeling. You I think know? it's a feeling. Mm, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. I'm, I'm, I'm on you with that. I mean, yes, yes. yes. For me, blank check is a question <laughs> posed at the listener. How much of this shit can you take? <laughs> and really? you answer right now. I couldn't disagree more. Well, you know, it's it's funny you bring that up because uh, we threw open to our listeners uh, a challenge, uh, a vote Did to you? name this miniseries. Yeah. Right. And We're discussing the films of Jonathan Demme. Right. This, of course, Blank Check. It's a podcast about filmography. His directors have massive success early on in their career. You seem so exhausted of this. <laughs> blank Checks make whatever crazy passion products they want, and sometimes those checks clear, and sometimes they bounce. Baby. And right. this is a main series on the films of Jonathan Demme. Of course. And, and we, you know, we're whimsical fellows and we like to take one of the movies the director made and then, you know, change the title so it has the word podcast oh, in it. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> How right. whimsical. And we said, which of these should we pick? And it, with a resounding. Yeah, it was a majority. Yes. Uh, stop making podcasts, <laughs> one, which felt a little bit. A little pointed. A little pointed. Oh, great. So this is the titular episode. That's true. I'm surprised it's not pod making cast. Would have been nicer. Kind of would have been, been nicer. Less rude. Pod making checks. Right. No, I mean, to be fair, we did cast. give them the option. Okay. Yes. Right. We gave them a lot of options. Yeah. You should never give your audience an option to stop making podcasts. No. Right. And also, I mean, like, the silence of the podcast would have been mean in its own way, I suppose. Yes. Right. That's what you did the smart thing, which was just uh, decide to stop making podcasts. <laughs> yeah, I kind of went. I, there's no end to this. What if I just choose it? Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Well, too bad, because now you're a permanent guest on this podcast. All right. Ben, uh, ben hit, t- yeah, lock the doors. Hit the yeah. button. Lock All right. the gates. Lock, me lock the gates. Um, That's fair. Um, th- this is a mystery on the films of Jonathan Demme. It's called Stop Making Podcasts. And today we're talking about Stop Making Sense, a movie which uh, it, it spurred me to text David at 1130 last night and Correct. say – is this the most perfect movie ever made? It's so good. There's kind it is of a an pretty argument. unambiguously perfect movie. Right. Or perfect thing. Perfect right. anything. Are you guys covering all of his documentaries? We are not. No. Okay. Um, because that would take a very long time. Yes, it he would. He made five Neil Young movies alone. Sure. Today. Today. <laughs> and he's not even alive anymore. No, he's not. It's he just him going to concerts and being, I got to do something with all this footage I took from the audience. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, because he made one, two, three, four, five. Not nine documentaries total, including wow. this one. This is and a ten if you include Swimming to Cambodia, which is right. sort of like. And that. I don't. Yeah, well, there, well, there you go. Hey, Fine. That's why we put it behind the paywall. Yeah. Um, so this is, I suppose, this is us acknowledging his nonfiction work. Yes. Right. Uh, which unfortunately we just do not have the time to like completely cover. Yes. You should is- cover his TV work as well. Uh, the pilot of a gifted man. Yeah, that Patrick Wilson show is that him? Yeah, I think he directed three episodes of SNL. <laughs> right, uh, the what killing. Else we got. He directed an episode of the killing. Oh, Seven that one. Seconds on Netflix, which was released after he died. Oh, weird. That's yeah. right. Oh my god, Even that was weird. It's a show about the death of Jonathan Demme. <laughs> no one knows if I'm telling the truth or not. I don't no think one's ever heard of that show. Nope. Roy Scheider <laughs> plays Jonathan Demme. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, what if Netflix just starts announcing like, yeah, we're uh, I don't know, we're rebooting Jaws and Zazie Beats is in it. Look, <coughs> you call us on it. Try you, and find it. You know what I would love? <laughs> it's up there right now. <laughs> Try and find. You it. know the way that Netflix just bought you from Lifetime and then was like, it's yeah, a Netflix me. original. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They yeah. bought David Sims, yeah, of course, right. in an overall <laughs> deal. But they also bought the Penn Badgley star you. Mm-hmm. Which yes. had aired. You've, you've, you've spoken about this on uh, the podcast. This is a it's new like idea. Your, your bugbear. This is okay. a new joke I'm going to make. Okay, great. Aired on Lifetime in its totality. Four people watched it. Right. Mm. Nine months later, Netflix stamps an original on, on the title and it becomes their fourth most watched show in history or sure, whatever. Sure. Uh, Eight trillion people watch it, according yeah, yeah, to the yeah. recent data. Right, right, right. Uh, what if they just started doing that with other pre existing things? Yeah, like they Grey's took, Anatomy. If they took 75's Jaws and were like, it's a Netflix original. Yeah, right. They we could very well do that. They could do we that. We made yeah. this, yeah. Yeah. It's Steven Spielberg. He's what? Call him. Perfect yeah. Strangers? That was us. Yeah, Netflix original. <laughs> they uh, buy he, anything with strange in the title. Demi uh, yeah. also <laughs> directed a Columbo episode. Did he? Well, mm-hmm. that must have been early, right? Uh, Last quite early. We well, we mean early... <laughs> It was it was just a fake yeah, idea. <laughs> I was like, I know it's done, yeah. but I have an idea for Columbo. You guys um, don't remember Columbo 2017? I would genuinely watch. Well, no, I wouldn't. <laughs> I was gonna say I genu- genuinely watch a new Columbo, but I'm like, where? I don't have the time. <laughs> I would, right, right, exactly. I would love for someone else man. to make a Columbo and for me to go. Damn, this sounds pretty nice. Do you know what's the one I saw floated on Netflix? You just That's a really good idea. TV development in yeah. this decade. <laughs> yeah. Netflix, please get in contact. I have an idea. Skip the thing you just heard. I'll tell you about it in person. The thing I saw float on Netflix uh, – on Netflix. Sorry. Netflix on the brain. The thing I saw people float on Twitter mm-hmm. that is a genuinely good idea is Mark Ruffalo doing Columbo. Yeah. <sighs> yeah. Right? That's good. Yeah. Yeah. You need like a squinty guy like that. A, a, a rumpled man. Yeah, well, if, you need if, a rumple. If we can't get <laughs> Mark Ruffalo – and it's got to be a squinty Mark guy. Yeah. I think French Stewart is available. Oh, bro. <laughs> Come um, on, French Stewart uh, Columbo. One last question. <laughs> Gilbert Gottfried is going to be the new Columbo? I think he did it. <laughs> he is rumpled. <laughs> Has any man looked more like laundry <laughs> than Gilbert I'm, Gottfried? That's what I'm saying. It looks like you just unrolled him. Just a small bag of laundry. <laughs> yeah. A little pint-sized bag of laundry. Interesting. I guess we've got a mystery on our hands. What's he doing right now? Gil Gilbert? Gilbert? Yeah, Gil. Having a nice sandwich in the park. Yeah, that's nice. <laughs> He's like touring like a fiend. Guys, that's I, cool. I, Let's I realized go see this. Him. Yeah. I realized this today, just shortly before coming here. Today, the day we're recording yes. this. Yes. Is the 35th anniversary of Stop Making Sense. Yes, this is the day. Gilbert Godfrey and stuff. Yeah. No, yeah, it's got Gilbert Godfrey Stop Making Sense. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, that is insane. To commemorate. You yeah, are absolutely yeah. right. This film came out 35 years ago. Crazy. 1984. Night, this very night. Uh, on this very October 18th, um, in the United States, mm-hmm. um, and the release uh, date that matters. Yes. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. It got oh, a theatrical you know. release. A hundred percent. They weird. raised the budget for it, which was 1.2 million dollars by themselves, and it made 5.1 million dollars. Holy shit! Yeah. Um, and. Uh, also played in West Germany, mm-hmm. the cool. Netherlands. It won a bunch of awards. It came in third place in the National Board of Review's Best Film of the Year. Now, I know yeah. that— Along with winning Best Documentary. I know they say Jonathan Demme got Best Director uh, at, for Silence of the Lambs, yes, but that's it, was, right. it was for this, right? Yeah, it was a makeup. Know, for this. just like— I mean, well, I mean, we're going to dig when into Demi it, was So Jonathan Demi, I'm yeah. David Sims. We should introduce our guest. Griffin today. Newman, our guest today, of course, by returning, fan demand. Yes. Returning. Hashtag Demi on Demi. I kind of did also demand myself. I was just like, it's hey, fine. I'll do this. It was a fine demand. But look, we Thank were you. very surprised by Demi winning. He was in our bracket, as you know, and he was, you know, plowing through big names. He yeah. was knocking them aside. But I think a lot of the reason was a couple... Friends of the show, such as yourself, mm-hmm. vouching for him and saying, I would cover this. Which uh, we saw a big Adija Webe bump. We did. Well, it's a famous bump. It's know? a big bump. It's I start big talking, bump. people are like, mm, I guess we got to do that uh, Columbo yeah. series now. <laughs> but Emily Vanderwerf coming up on this miniseries. Yep. Uh, Bobby Finger, Lindsay Weber coming up on this miniseries. Yep. People who said, like, here's my case for Demi. This is the episode I would want to do. And people got excited 
at the prospect of those episodes. And this was a big – we've had people for the last nine months saying Demi is coming on, right? Yeah, people – yeah, people have asked me like, are you still going to do Stop Making Sense? Wow. And I'm like, yes. That's nice. You sort of booked a trip around this. I did. <laughs> we've been talking for like nine months and we were like, let's just figure out roughly the time that it makes sense for you to come to New York. I was like, look, I'll, I'll – I like New York. I'll probably be – have something to do around right, there. sure. Later, and I didn't, but then I was like, I'd like to take a vacation around New England and just... Sure. Yeah. So you I was were in like, upstate New York, I saw on your yeah, Instagram. A very nice time. Lovely Went place. to Albany and drove around. That's not important here. Okay. Well, you been, you've been it's going flavor. through... You know, it's, it's you, you've been going through something of a creative reset that I have very much envied. Sure. It's like at the end of Mad Men. Yes. When he uh, invents the Coke ad. Mm-hmm. I'm yes. hoping yes. I drive around New England. Right. Come on with the Coke ad. And then I just get, ding, interior... <laughs> I don't have it yet, but it's going to be Columbo. <laughs> it's definitely going to start indoors, though. Yeah. yeah. It's, shit could be outdoors. Fuck. Fuck. The fuck. only way you could pitch, the best way to pitch Columbo to Netflix or whatever would right. be to go in, pitch like six just bullshit ideas. <laughs> and they're like, what? We thought we were, you're like, okay, I mean, oh, it was nice to meet you. And you're like, great. Nice to meet you, too. You walk out, and then you're like, one more thing, though. Yeah. <laughs> you turn around, you're like, whoa, wait, one more thing. And then you open and they're like, your long coat to reveal <laughs> a full pitch deck for Columbo. And it's like, wait, this was the thing the whole time? Mm-hmm. Correct. And they're like, um, well, Universal has the rights to those. And, they're, and you're like, oh, okay, I'll, I'll see you later. Uh, <laughs> one more thing. And then you plug your USB drive into their projector. <laughs> one second, one second. It's in the, it's one of these folders. Uh, God, Windows, oh, oh boy. Wait, um, but you photoshopped a deck for perfect or strangers for nothing? <laughs> perfect or strangers. They should make perfect stranger things. Yeah, they should. Right? That's a thing. I don't know. I could probably sell that. They're both in the 80s. That's yeah. it. That's all you need. Yeah. Sounds good. I mean, isn't this – now it's just Stranger Things? Like they're, they're like, we all love Clueless. And I'm like, we do. Yeah. And they're like, <laughs> what if? And I'm yeah. like, mm, I don't know. And they're like, it's like a drama. And it's like, you know, there's weird mystery yeah. and like maybe something supernatural. And I'm like – Oh, cool. The opposite uh-huh. of what I like about Clueless. <laughs> right. Literally the upside down to the clueless I like. Oh, now the Breakfast Club. What yeah. if? Okay, love we're it. actually having breakfast. Okay, now, here's the thing. Here's the thing. Okay, we're having breakfast. I love breakfast. Sounds good. And then one of them gets murdered. Uh, what? Boy. Yeah. No, but but you love the Breakfast Club, right? <laughs> you kids ain't leaving attention till you figure out who murdered this one. Yeah. Can Columbo be on the case? Okay, fun. let's just every single pop. Yeah, all of it. <laughs> it's like that games ma- master Anthony uh, guy, but of. A reference for no one in the room. That's fine. Who's, so the who's thing about <laughs> stop making sense. Yes. I have a confession to make. Okay. This is the only Jonathan Demme movie I've ever seen. Wow. You've never seen uh, The Silence of Yon Lambs? I have not seen The Silence wow. of Lambs that's, that's, or Philadelphia that's sure. or even, despite being me, Ricky and The Flash. Right? <laughs> yes. Right. It's and got both for the price of I know. One. I've seen one. Yeah. I have not seen The Flash. Right. That's crazy. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. You never saw Rachel Get Mary? No. I never much. saw. I was invited. But couldn't make it. <laughs> I, w- I never saw. Did you get a plus one? You never swam to Cambodia. No, that's why I didn't go. Gotcha. Right, right. right. Never you swam. never heard the truth about Charlie. I'm running out of. You that. are still unmarried to the mob, right? Correct. Yeah, uh, right, right. I I know Melvin. Don't know Howard very well. Yes. Mm-hmm. Uh, what else? What else? Is- Seven seconds. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you watched that, obviously. I yeah. went through his Wikipedia and I was like, I've got. I've seen some. Th- oh, nothing. None of it. Um. Well, one. I would say, check him out. He's yeah. good. He's a cool dude. Yeah. He made a movie you like. Yeah, well, a lot uh, of people made movies I like. Right, but I'm going to watch their work. Yeah. Um, but number two, as Demi was sort of, you know, gaining steam in the bracket, and mm-hmm. some people were sort of like, oh, Demi, like, does he have a thing? Like, yeah. he's kind of a, you know, every man mm-hmm. or a kind of a, like, motley sort of, you know, weird filmography. And it's like, yeah, 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 but one... Silence of the Lambs, obviously, hugely influential. Yeah, one of the most important movies ever made. Yeah. Right. And two, he basically invented and perfected the concert movie and has never been beaten at, well, with here, it. Right? Here's like, what's interesting. So there's – on the Blu-ray they have um, – they did like an hour-long press conference mm-hmm. at the San Francisco Film Festival maybe. Sure. It was the 15th I anniversary. I believe that's where this uh, debuted. It was the 15th the anniversary of where the film had premiered originally. Mm. And yeah, they it was had, San Francisco. Yeah, they had done a, a remaster of the soundtrack. Sure. This was the first uh, digital audio film. Is yeah, that correct? Yes, that's right. Ever? Yes, yes, yes. Yes. So they had remastered the soundtrack and re-released it in 1999. And they did this hour-long press conference that was the first time the band had been reunited in – 
a decade, sure. maybe a little less, uh, and was until they did the uh, Hall of Fame induction mm-hmm. in 2002. Yeah. Because um, they were one of those bands that like had a somewhat – acrimonious split but also weren't assholes to each other yeah like right. that thing where they all seemed to be fairly civil with each other and when there was a reason to come together didn't let their egos overrun that yeah yeah um but they did this press conference together and they were talking about how because i think of it as oh right this is the movie that like crystallizes the concert film perfects it what have you and they were like it kind of feels like this was the last concert film like they go a little out of vogue after this. Sure. And a reason they said was they financed this film themselves, one point seven million. But after this, the music video really takes off. Right, right. Yeah. This is right around the same time that MTV is launching. And they yes. would rather spend that money per music video and make right. multiple music videos. Right, right. Where no one wants to do this. And this Demi continues sense. to make a lot of concert films. Yeah. But they become nicher things. His mm-hmm. last movie ever is him doing a John uh, Justin Timberlake. Concert movie for you Some guessed say that's it. what killed him. Netflix. Yes. Um, it's true. Can I call a timeout real quick? Please. Sure. This is going to get very confusing if we keep going. Demi I know. And, I know. Can I change my name for the sake of this pod? 100%. What Please. would you like to be called? I don't know. Dave? Cool. Well, wait a second. <laughs> no, Dave, that Dave is David. Let's do David. It's cleaner. <laughs> okay. But what, what do you, because he's David. You're David, right? Yeah. Dave. What do you want to go by? <laughs> right, maybe Demi? Yeah, right. I'll go by uh, Jonathan. Yeah. Great. Okay. Right. Oh, right. there we right. go. Okay. Jonathan. Perfect. Okay. Perfect. Oh, boy. So we were talking about Demi. Yes. Well, Music videos, right. concert movies. I guess that makes sense. But also doesn't it well, feel you like... you should stop making sense. Huh? You should stop making sense. If it's I will making sense, you very should stop that. <laughs> Some yeah. say I never started. Yeah. Uh, it also feels like the concert film doesn't like have like a profitable avenue in theaters much yes. anymore. Like no. what's the... That's like, a what are difference. hit concert movies apart from Stop Making Sense? Well, films? there ben, was – You like music? Beyonce's yeah. Homecoming is That's truly what like – I was going to say. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. But that becomes – right. Like an HBO thing. Or like Never Say Never, the Bieber one. Well, that was a genuine was hit, say. right? Yeah. Yeah. There was like Perry's a Katy Perry me. one, there right? Was, there was that um, 3D thing. That was the right. period. Ever put vibe. out a bunch. Right. Of, <laughs> those are great. Um, Real crowd pleasers. Uh, I love Guar. There's the period that starts with the Hannah Montana 3D concert. Sure. Oh, yeah. Which, because that tour was selling out so crazy, they were like, we should film it so people who can't get into the tour can see it. It was supposed to be like a one week theatrical run, Mm -hmm. and it ended up grossing like $80 million. And then that became like Bieber does it twice, Katy Perry does it, the Jonas Brothers do it, One Direction does it. Like, it becomes like big callbacks do it. The top 10. Music top ten highest grossing okay. music concert films of all time. Number, number one, one, Michael Jackson. This is it. No, that is number two. Bieber has him beat by about a million dollars. For never Take say that. never. Yes, exactly. Which is finally children get their revenge. Never say never is a great film. Have you folks seen it? No, I have not. I had it. I will on never DVD say never for to see a it. period of time, <laughs> uh-huh. and I don't remember why. Uh-huh. Sure. But I also did not watch it. Never say I never. Will never say never. But this I is the other that. distinction. Never Say Never is half documentary about the Justin Bieber phenomenon, half concert sure. right, 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 And the right, stuff right. about the phenomenon is incredible. Like, it's actually pretty sort of uh, cutting. John Chu, uh, Crazy Rich yeah. Asians director, is yes. the filmmaker behind Never Say Never. Yeah, so it's about Bieber mania mm-hmm. as much as it's a, a concert film. Yeah. yeah. And there was, yes, there was This Is It, which a perfect came out film after he died. Is holds that right? Up perfectly, a thing we'll definitely be discussing soon. Yes, it came out after he died. It is that was the tour he was supposed to do. Right. It's yes, the, right, right, the right. behind the scenes footage of the rehearsals for the concert. Right. And then right. no one ever talked about that dude again, right? Uh, everyone was like, Michael Jackson, Great. book closed, done, put it back up on the shelf, keep it there forever. Number um, this is it is really weird and really morbid. Hmm. And it's also like they they right, they post converted it to 3D because some of the concert was going to be in 3D or whatever. But it's so like they hyped up so much. It's like this is his final statement. And then you watch it and you're like, this is two hours of a sick man doing half energy rehearsals. Right, yeah. right, right, right. I forgot I had all that like footage of him getting ready for it. Right. Yeah. But it is. It's just him like running shit in like a, a unfinished stage. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's cool. Gross. Number three, <laughs> the Hannah Montana, Miley Cyrus, Best of Both Worlds concert tour. Uh-huh. Uh, so I guess she like switches wigs, right? She Basically, does. She does half thing, right? uh, Hannah, half Miley. How mm-hmm. far down the list is Bohemian Rhapsody? <laughs> Uh, no, because that really feels like I was there. Right. Wait, right, right. is that not a documentary? It is, right? Oh, it's got to be. That thing was fact for fact, line yes. for line. It was right. just 
pure realism. You know what? I, I love all the real singing in that thing, too. You're just watching a man open his mouth and that <laughs> the voice coming out. The wildest thing, and I'm, I may have brought this up before, is the, the scene where he is just at the piano and I think just singing Happy Birthday. And even that is like... Like they've just taken Freddie Mercury singing and like dubbed yeah. it over. <laughs> yeah. It's like it sounds like he's in like a recording booth when he's just like at his family home going like happy birthday. <laughs> That's how good he was. Yeah. <sighs> it's true. It's true. He was always professional. Yeah. Number four, One Direction. Mm-hmm. Number five, Katy Perry. One Number Direction s- directed by I don't know fucking Jonathan Demme, John Chu, Morgan, Morgan Spurlock. What? Oh, of course. Oh boy. How, uh, how weird is everything? <laughs> As we go down this list, isn't everything strange? Uh, hey, one for him, one for the studios. Yeah. So you got Katy Perry. You got yes. the Jonas Brothers. These mm-hmm. are all in the same, like, five years. The Katy Perry one's kind of fascinating because it's half about her divorce to Russell Brand. Right, right. And then mm. you have 91's Madonna Truth or Dare, yes. which was a, more of a classic concert movie, right? right? But a li- but also a little more of a, like, on the road with Madonna. Yeah, movie. yeah, yeah, right, right, right. And, like, the poster's, like, her in bed. Yeah. It's, you know, ooh. The fact, intimate. the fact that this movie has nothing but the concert. Well, that's why one of the billion reasons it's so perfect is yeah. that there's yeah. not some fucking behind the scenes like handheld camera and like David Burns like, ooh, let's, let's we're getting ready, right? Talking like, heads, talking heads. Right. Yeah, there's no pretense of like uh, this is what they're really like behind. It's like. Okay, we know this is like fake and constructed. This is a performance, we don't care. Yeah. right? They're right. going to give you the fucking show of your life. Yeah, and it's right. Uh, um, just to finish this half ten, Glee yeah. the 3D concert movie. Oh, right, which uh, I directed actually. Of I just, yeah, yeah, for Good a job. Uh, number nine is U two 3D, which mm. I think was I pretty recent. About that. Yeah, and the number ten is Rattle and Hum. The the oh, the yeah. old YouTube movie that yeah. kind of tanked their careers for a second, where like yeah, uh, Bono is like. The devil? Uh, yeah. Well, yes. No, no, no. That's later. Right. No, where Bono's like, Charles Manson took Helter Skelter from the Beatles and we're taking it back. You know, he's like just full like ego mode. What a ah. guy. Where he's like, play the blues, Edge. Play the blues. Yeah. No? No one? Yep. No, yeah. I'm not said, saying it. I said, yeah. I mean, all right. So, yeah, that's the, the concert movie boom really was just for a few years that there. That 3D like, run sort of for like, like 2008 to 2011. Yeah. Hmm. yeah. Yeah. Apart from that, I mean, there's the class. Yeah, there was a Prince. I mean, the Sign of the Times. Right. There's Last some Neil Waltz. Young ones. Last Waltz. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, know. Woodstock. You have you have a lot of festival uh, Monterey pop. Right. Yeah, sure. Right. One that stuck out to me, I remember The Carter. It was about Little Wayne. Mm-hmm. He tried fighting it uh, because – the filmmakers left in scenes of when he's all messed up on uh, liquid codeine oh, in front of God. his daughter. Right? It's really yeah, not it's a good dark. look. Yeah, it's super dark. Yeah, but right. it's also that thing of read your contract. Wasn't there a Ron Howard Jay Z movie? <laughs> what? I swear to God, there was a movie called Fade to Black that was when Jay Z said he was retired, directed by Ron Howard. Uh, it's called Made in America. Oh my God! Actually, but yes. Is there not a movie called Fade to Black? I don't fucking know. I'm going to look this up. I think Ron Howard directed it. The think- one that Ron Howard directed is called Made in America. Okay. You definitely uh, just like made some like execs go like, wait a minute. And like they're calling both Jay-Z and Ron Howard tonight. The one you're talking about is a different. Okay. It's different director. Not Ron Howard. Yes. Right. Okay. So there are two different Jay-Z movies. Yes. Um, th- this, this fucking movie. Well, here's the thing. Okay. So you're saying like it's weird that this is the only Demi I've seen. And in, uh, th- yeah. in many directors' careers, that would be like, well, then you haven't really seen their movies. I mean, they, the concert or documentary they're directed, that's not like really one of their films. Right. Whereas this is one of his major films. 100%. It's also like one of the first times I've seen a performance thing directed in a way where I can tell like the director's influence. Yes. Right. They like, didn't just like turn the cameras on and right. point it at the stage. Or just go like, okay, well, we'll edit this. Like it feels like there are times where he's like, well, this one's going to be presented entirely in close ups. We're going to like shoot just on David Byrne uh, for this like dancing sequence and things yeah. and i'm like how much i wonder how much input he had just even into like choreography or in the being like well we want to follow like the crew coming onto stage with them like yeah. yes of also, course right. yes Th- i mean this is uh this is one of the few uh documentaries by a largely fiction filmmaker where you can observe everything that makes them important as a filmmaker within yeah. this film yes you know you, this can be the only jonathan demi film you've seen and you have a sense of who he was as a person and as a filmmaker. Everyone is sure. screaming, no, <laughs> watch others. I mean, you should watch others. You yeah. should. Uh, good movie. can't believe we never saw Sons of the Lambs. I, I just know. feel like that's a movie people just are forced to see at Yeah, some that's point. so crazy, David. 
I I mean I went to Freaking film hell. school. I really should. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, sure, right, right. Yeah. But I I don't know. How, it's one of those things that like I don't know. There's so many big movies where it's like I can't believe I haven't seen that yet. But yeah, Silence one should be uh, near top of that list. Mm. Although that's because we just recently rewatched it and are jamming on it so fucking. We hard. are jamming on it hard. That episode's coming up soon. Um, but uh, it is it is great. It is one of those movies I worry that like if you see it for the first time now you're like because it's so invented that sort of like. Yeah. You know, crime, sort of the master psychopath mm-hmm. type, right? Like that, like it'll feel like, oh, well, I've seen this, right? I, I it's, think it is so but absorbing I think it's perfect. that yes, you're, right. yeah, you're like, oh, this is why everyone else does this, right? Because this is the time it was done perfectly. Right. Um, the Talking Heads wanted to do a concert film, sure. By all accounts, they thought it was like the next step. They were obviously uh, a very conceptual band. I mean, if we want to go back further. Talking Heads are that that fascinating like subgenre of like uh, uh, art projects that become legitimate bands. Mm-hmm. You know, groups that start like Devo and Guar as sort of more like conceptual like performance pieces or projects, and then end up becoming like actual hit. They, they bands. were a, a RISD, yes, a group, really? right? They came mm-hmm. out of Rhode Island School of Design. I did not know Bunch that. Bunch of buds. Well, except Doing for weird stuff, except, except for, for Jerry Harrison, right? He comes who in a little later. Right, was in the Modern Lovers. Yes, great, it's a Harvard right. band with Jonathan Richmond, which is a great, great band. But huh. they're like, is a band that like everyone in it went on to do something else amazing, but they broke up before they even released their first album, and their first album is perfect. Yep. Yeah. yeah. They're on um, the album. But they go from being a RISD band to then being one of the bands in, like, the first major CBGB's wave. Right. Oh, right, right, right. And where everyone else in CBGB's is, Their first gig was opening for the Ramones. Yeah. Yeah. Like, the the crazy – the juxtaposition of who they were performing against and the fact that they held their own when their reputation at the time was they are the only band that is not very performancey. Like, everyone else is making such a theatrical experience in terms of energy or dancing or aggression or whatever it is. Or a transgression. look or a sound. Yeah. Totally. And the Talking Heads, their reputation in the CBGB's days was they just get up on stage and they do really good music. Like, they captivate people because the music is so good, they right. let it speak for themselves. But they kind of had, like, a clean-cut sort of look, right? Like, they weren't, They you look kind of like dorks. Punky, right. But they're yeah, also yeah, yeah. not making it a sort of, like, this is our brand, we're dorks. Sure. They look like art school kids. Right. And they right. would just get up and perform, like, pretty perfectly crafted songs immaculately. <laughs> well, the songwriting was dark. Yes. You know, and, Psycho like, of killer. the time. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that first album, is, I mean, as a debut, is so fucking good. I Tell me it, what do you think of the Talking Heads. I love them. I am, like, so unfamiliar with, like, earlier aspects mm-hmm. of mm-hmm. their, like, work, but I... I distinctly remember getting to Talking Heads because I was friends uh, with someone in college, and they had there's this song by this band Friendly Fire. It's called In the Hospital, and I mm-hmm. played it for a friend once. She was like, "Seems like a rip off of that song Cross Eyed and Painless," which mm-hmm. I never heard, but mm-hmm. I listened to it. And I was like, "Oh, I guess it is a rip off." And then like she introduced me to Radiohead, and then told me that Radiohead got their name from the Talking Heads song Radiohead. Right. And I was just kind of like, "Oh, weird. This band's coming up a lot." And then we watched Stop Making Sense, and I was like, "This is really fucking cool." And yeah. like, so, I think Speaking in Tongues is one of my favorite albums ever and I just like I love them so much and they they have this like I don't know it, it's very weird that they like started as not a very performance band yeah. cuz to me like they're so intrinsically linked with like this sort of like visual weirdness and like of even course. right yeah like true stories and the fucking like music video for once in a lifetime it's just right. d- David Byrne being I'm just like true stories which is basically like the blank check he gets to cash off of this yeah. right which like, Demi this, produces right yes, yeah I mean that thing is so special in yeah. its own way yeah we should do true stories. I mean, uh, we're, Yoshida would kill us if we did it without her. But we're getting increasingly into this idea of uh, one movie blank check directors. Oh yeah, just like weird little projects that one happened. Yeah. yeah, Robert De Niro's. Uh, he did two. Oh, he's, he's got two. List. Bronx Damn. Tale, Good Shepherd. I'd do it. I like both those movies. I know you do. Who, who else has directed one movie? Tom Green. We recently mm, were on a, a real like run about this. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, there's a lot of weird one? ones. Is that Night of the Hunter? Yeah, Night yes. of the Hunter, uh, which is the best. We had a text her with her friend Alex Ross Perry. Mm. Uh, a lot of actors who only did one, right? Like uh, Leah Schreiber doing Everything Is Illuminated. Still huh? so weird. Remember like, Everything Is Illuminated? That book. Didn't know he directed that. Sure. Okay. Didn't know. Yep. But it, uh, Elijah Wood. Yeah, right. Mr. Yeah, Vin Diesel only directed one feature film. He did the, the feature multifacial it's strays. Oh, yeah, no, right. Multifacial was the short, right? Yeah, right. Yeah. Strays. strays. It's so like I remember watching multifacial in college. I mean, like 
the Fast and Furious guy did this? <laughs> yeah. So weird. And it played a con, and Steven Spielberg discovered him. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And he's a crazy movie star. End of story. Hey, guys. Uh, David here to talk to you about our friends at Stamps.com. I always wonder whom the world goes to the post office and why. Because Stamps.com can bring the post office right to you. You don't need to interrupt your work day, fight traffic to get to the post office. My one's in a really weird location. I have to like walk under a railway bridge to just to just to get in the door. And especially now during the holidays when it's really busy with people sending holiday gifts and cards, you can just use stamps.com. Anything you can do at the post office, you can do there. It eliminates all the trips, saves you money with discounts you can't even get at the post office. We use it for blank check. We've got an account. We got our scale. We got our postage that you can just print out. You can send stuff. To happy fans, brings all the services of the U.S. Postal Service right to your computer. If you're a small office sending invoices or an online seller shipping out some products or a warehouse sending out thousands of packages a day, Stamps.com can handle it all with ease. You just use your computer to print official U.S. postage 24-7 for any letter, any package, any class of mail, anywhere you want to send it. Once it's ready, you just hand it to your mail carrier. You drop it in a mailbox. It's that simple. With Stamps.com, you get... Five cents off every first class stamp and up to 40% off priority mail. Not to mention it's a fraction of the cost of those expensive postage meter. All right. So don't spend a minute of your holiday season at the post office this year. Sign up for stamps.com instead. There's no risk with my promo code check. You get a special offer that includes a four-week trial plus free postage and a digital scale. No long-term commitments or contracts. Just go to stamps.com. Click on the microphone at the top of the homepage. Type in check. That's stamps.com. Enter check. Stamps.com, never go to the post office again. So going back to your point about Radiohead, I thought watching this again, uh, and I've seen Radiohead a bunch of times, I mean, this feels like such an influence on their live act Mm -hmm. with the video screens and just sort of like uh, really showing just like even like thinking about Johnny Greenwood plugging in all these like analog Mm -hmm. like plugs into a big synth. Like I love how this movie really shows you how – these musicians contribute to the sound, like with having them come in and different I mean, that's, layers. It's, it's so, so good. And it makes you really concentrate every, you know, with the introduction of every person on like what they're bringing musically to I the know, song. It's beautiful. It's, it's fucking beautiful. Right. Whereas, the rules. As a, and, and this is a band with an extremely dynamic showman who is putting on this incredibly athletic sort of like involving oh performance. God, I was worried for him. I, yeah. When well, he, you're like, like Jesus, he's there's a point shaking, where he's just running. starts doing laps around. I'm like, <laughs> right. but you're doing this now. He's just in a to suit. Yeah. Like he's not like in athletic wear. Yeah. And, and at the same time, he's like, just like, I feel like there's so much care in highlighting everyone else who's performing. Totally. Yeah, yeah. totally. I mean, and that, that is the beauty of the way, uh, I, to fill in these blanks a little here, I, I read this uh, – I, I went on a rabbit hole uh, last night and this morning of reading things about the Talking Heads and there was a New Yorker piece about uh, Fear of Music um, that uh, has this this little graph that I found uh, really, really spot on. Uh, in the late 1970s in primordial downtown Manhattan, the band sonified not just longing and regret – most great musicians do that – but also dread. Some do that. Mm. And then – this is what made them really special, mingled the feelings into single songs, sounds, and even couplets while never letting listeners forget they knew what they were doing. Mm. That is like the weird magic trick of them of like something yeah. about them feels very light but right. also very haunted. Right. Yeah. They're very earnest but there's also something very sarcastic about them. Right. And the actual craftsmanship is pretty perfect while feeling mostly emotional. Right. I mean the thing about their songs is unlike a lot of conceptual bands – Almost all of their songs work on some pure emotional level. Right. The it's emotion- just a pop song. Right. The emotionality right. of, the, of the music and right. of the lyrics. Yeah. You know? And like Heaven, which is one of my ten favorite songs of all time, if not one of my five favorite songs of all time, people have endlessly debated what that song is about. Mm-hmm. He sometimes offers explanations. Place, so. Well, but that's – sometimes there are like legends that's like, oh, it's about a gay bar he went to one time uh-huh. that he felt was this safe haven and it was called Heaven. And sometimes it's not about a specific place. It's about a feeling. And sometimes it's about – you know, a specific time in his life that then he relates to heaven. And sometimes it's people saying that that's what they heard. And sometimes it's him saying a thing, but then denying another thing. But it is just like the song is so simple. Yeah. And but feels so honest and deeply felt that it can mean any of those things. I feel like like I have a weird 
usually when I listen to music, it feels like it's been weird for me to focus so much on the lyrics that I sort of let the meaning ruin like the music mm-hmm, for me. Sure. But with Talking Heads, I've always just kind of been like. I don't know what so many of these songs mean. And I'm just kind of like, whatever. And this it, music rules. Yeah. Interesting thing is uh, David Byrne a lot of times improvised lyrics. Like yes. he didn't write songs sometimes. They would just go in the studio, kind of have like a, a sense of like kind of the structure of a song. And he would just make up lyrics. That's what it's it so feels like crazy. a lot of the time. Yeah. yeah. But uh, I don't know. There are certain songs where it's like this must be the place. And I'm like, well, I can tell this is clearly like a love song. But I couldn't tell you like distinct – things about the words he's yeah, saying or right. anything but like it's yes. also impressive i feel like their music also just if things had gone differently i could see them being like a very good like children's band totally just like the m- instrumentation is so like specific percent. and strange and like he's got this he's this weird front man where i'm just like if they were just like we just really want money they could very well be like on a show with puppets or some shit and just I so don't know. you were saying so true your introduction was watching this film after people bringing uh, talking heads up to you you watched this movie before you were really listening to the album yes but i had also i think in the same like span of time i had also heard burning down the house and this must be the place a lot sure. around but i wasn't like super into talking heads i i pretty much had the same thing i mean i saw this young because my dad was obsessed with this movie i also saw it fairly young the first time it's, i was about to say like this is a movie that's relatively appealing to a kid yeah yeah because even the part at the end where you see like the kid on his dad's shoulders yeah. and, like the unicorn i'm like of course it's yeah 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 yeah. My my dad had the albums and the covers and the titles of the albums were so striking yes. and so different yes. that I would ask him about them a lot. And then he finally like – I think they – when they re-released it with that remaster in right. 99, he took me to see it at the film forum. Uh, and it, it is one of those things where like I was sort of uh, – anytime my parents tried to take me to a documentary, it felt like vegetables. Sure. You know, and there were like once every couple of years in New York State, there'd be one where it's like, this is a documentary that's good for kids. Right. My parents would try to sell me on it being excited, and I'd be like, where's the narrative, baby? Right, 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 <laughs> you right. know? I like acts, three of them. Right. And so I was like such a story kid that I was like, I don't know about a concert documentary, but there, there are these things. I mean, there is, without it being a Broadway musical, which I feel like a lot of concerts turn into these days. Yeah. Uh, there is this sort of narrative build to it not just with the introduction of, of each band member one at a time which i could really latch on to and go like okay there's there's a progression here yes, there's something yes, happening yes. it's not just a series of songs but that each song has its own little kind of universe to it um demi said that that's what he responded to i mean they right so they do this weird like reverse arc of like conceptual project RISD band people actually like the music they come to new york they are in the sort of Punk scene. Punk scene yeah. New wave, though. Like, like they're, they're new wave. in their right. own but lane. But, but, but yes. you know, I yes. feel like initially, right, that they're, they're more playing with, They're, like, they're doing the – they're new wave the in guys. punk clubs and they're sort yeah. of bridging the two. Right, right. right. Um, right. But then as they become bigger and they start producing albums, then the sort of conceptual art brains of four RISD students uh, or three RISD students <laughs> and a member of the modern romance – uh, uh, Lovers. Sorry. It's okay, carry on, carry on. Uh, I apologize, Jonathan. Uh, that starts coming back in, and then it starts to be that intentionality of what are we wearing, what are we projecting behind us, and yeah. how do we sort of make an arc to a show. Similarly, though, also to The Clash, if you think about later Clash stuff, when they started to incorporate world music sounds, right. electronic sure. sounds, I see a similar trajectory with the talking heads yeah. of really expanding their sound, right. they like bringing Afro in more beat. elements. Mm, right. Yes, right. Right. I feel like that was so hot in the 80s. The, well, yeah. Simon as well. Like, right. You know, all, yeah. all of that. Right. But, but like of those three examples, World they're not, music. They're not the only ones. Well, I remember David Byrne wrote a piece that was like the front page of the Arts and Leisure section in the New York Times like 20 years ago that was Why I Hate World Music. Sure. And it was the purposefully incendiary headline that but was he him meant saying like the genre. It is gross sort of, that right, we right, consider yes. everything that the is kind not of like American record rack, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, to yeah, be yeah. world, and was just sort of breaking down how distinct and different you know these different regions and the genres within each region and all of that. And as opposed to the other examples you're throwing out, the way the Talking Heads use the music of other cultures feels the least like appropriation to sure. me. Because whereas something like Graceland is like a great album in which Paul Simon was just like, oh, Lady Smith, Black Mambazo, roll. If I just put him on an album, that will sound great. Yeah. Which is correct. He was proven correct. Yeah. This feels more like them actually digging into the elements of what makes different cultural musics uh, resonate and reusing those pieces in their own way. That doesn't sound like anything else. 
Yeah, it doesn't sound like they're just going like, oh, we should use this instrument from a different culture. It's totally. Yeah. It, it really right. feels like, you know, or the way that the Clash used Brege or anything. It mm-hmm. really feels yeah. like they're making something entirely new mm-hmm. just with a broader reference Even base. look at Tom Tom Club, right? Yeah. Right. Out, totally. of the, out of Tina and Chris's like side project, that's all like dance hall music. Yeah. Right. But it's I it's, think it's named after a, a dance hall in the Bahamas where they were practicing once before really? a concert. Yeah. I think that's what and the they Tom would Tom record in the ever. Bahamas a lot. Yes. Right? Huh. About. But yes. there's something playful about it. It's not. I, I I feel like it also just the success of that song. I think it's been like one of the most sampled songs oh, yeah. of like oh, all yeah. time. Yeah. Which is um, so weird that that's like the spin-off concept within a concept yeah. band. Yeah. You know? But but it gets a thing of like right, why it appeals to people as a child while this why this movie works for people who wouldn't necessarily even enter as Talking Heads fans is that aside from them being like, you know, consummate performers with great music, uh, directed perfectly, you know, by a really smart filmmaker. There is something so playful about them, and they have this weird balance of being incredibly conceptual and unpretentious. Mm-hmm. There's something very unpretentious about them, despite them yes. on their face doing the most pretentious Which is, shit in the world. Is a wild thing to say because they do seem so pretentious. They seem right? so pretentious. And like that interlude in the middle where it's like, you know, like salad, pig. I don't, I forget what the right. words are, but you know, like <laughs> you know what I mean, game. right? Yeah. Exactly. And you're like, you know, fax machine. That should be. So easy to satirize, and of course it That's became like a purity easy to, of an right. installation piece. But like, right. for, I don't know. For this, you're right. It does feel like this incredibly sincere and lovely like performance. And Not goofy. Like, There's something yeah. about them owning their goofiness. Yeah. I mean, I was thinking a lot about uh, because I knew you were coming in here, but but you and your work and how much you've talked about like that you have all these sort of very uh, sincere ambitions and what you want to do in different mediums. Right. And you've become this kind of comedy person, and you're always trying to figure out how to also be able to make your non-comedic works. Right. And not have the two contrast. And, like, Talking Heads are an example of a band with a really good sense of humor Mm -hmm. that never feel like a joke band. Yeah, totally. I I think they – I think one of the things that really makes that come across in the performance and whatnot is how so much of it is clearly like choreographed, but the the moments that you feel like, oh, holy shit, this band like loves each other and is like great collaborators right. are the parts where it's like they're dancing on stage in a way that seems like it's clearly just of the moment. That's or like, the Demi shit too, that he it, caught all of that stuff. Lo- I yeah. mean, he's a very empathetic filmmaker. He's very good at, right, like turn, making a person feel like a human on screen right. in like five seconds. Yeah. So they wanted to do a concert film because they felt like, you know, in their constant ex- expansion of let's find new ways to express ourselves, it seemed like the move. Mm-hmm. This is the one that comes out right before Speaking in Tongues? Uh, right, after right after speaking. Right okay. after. Yeah, because yeah. this is them on that tour. Right, yes. 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 right. Yes, yes, yes. Um, but they uh, – David Byrne just liked Demi's movies a lot, which at this point is the Demi comedies. But it makes sense. I mean you have not seen them yet, but like no. Something Wild feels like a Talking head song. Right, which is – Visually. Something Wild comes right after this. Right. This so this comes is in between Mob and Something shift. Wild? Okay. No, 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 no. It's been between Melvin and Howard and Something Wild. Weird. Mob is post Something Wild. That's Weird. late 80s. So I mean, those are the two that feel very talking headsy. So there's some act, maybe there's a little bit of a handoff between the two groups, Griffin's, between Demi um, and the talking, taking heads. his hands and sort of having them crisscross. It's the opposite of a handoff, actually. It's hands yeah. passing each other. I also feel like, in terms of concerts, right, we're still at this stage where like the sort of expensive arena show is not has is like nascent. That hasn't mm-hmm. happened yeah. yet, right? Like I love you too. Look, even though Bono sang the blues. <laughs> and um, like this is pre U two evolving into the like right our shows are like three sixty degrees incredibly stage. expensive loud with like lots of video screens and you can like show it to like sixty thousand people and it's not their fault but they kind of break something they like, do once yeah, right, they right, right, do right. that that becomes a thing that other people go like well if we're not doing that we look like pieces of shit it's right. also just like the money you can make doing something like that if you're big enough uh, is just sort of. Uncomparable. What, was that? what like, was that tour called? Something TV? Well, there's Zoo TV. That's the. Ugh, that. woof. Come on. He's a calls the president and orders it's a pizza. <laughs> he has like six bits that he does. He has the all these YouTube characters. He's got a character reel. Yeah. yeah. Great. Demi, you know this? There's, Demi come there's over to my house. We'll watch the Zoo TV tour. It's fun. It's great. You'll ben love is it. shaking his head no. no, no you'll <laughs> like it. He, Bono, he has all these characters. He's got like an American preacher character. You don't want to see that? I do want to see Bono do an American accent. Mm-hmm. It is It is Bono's Mad TV audition to, <laughs> for, to use my oft 
<laughs> used phrase for a certain type of character performance. Him yes. going like, if this YouTube thing doesn't work out, I could do something with Miss Swan. Right? Yeah, right. yeah. It feels like it's very Miss Swan adjacent <laughs> <laughs> in terms of energy. Um, he's 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 tiptoeing around Stewart that there's, whole concert. I, Zoo TV was the first one, and then there's I believe I want to. It's the Pop Mart tour is mm-hmm. the one where you two descended on stage in a giant lemon. Yeah, you know about that. Yes, and sometimes it would break and it would sort of like stall, and they'd have to be like, you know, just sort of oh. standing there in the lemon. And then the lemon would keep moving. I mean, like these things that cost anyway. This does is not that. This is so stripped down. It's totally. so simple, and it's like you know we're not yet at that thing where they're just trying to overwhelm you with produ- but, production value. But at the time, this must have seemed like oh wow, they're doing more than most people do in concerts. Yeah, yeah, and, right, and it's, right, But right. it's mostly just the intentionality of it. There's nothing crazy happening. There's no crazy pyrotechnics. That's what I mean. They're, there are they're no not huge wasting routines right, no. in a sort of like. Although I do wonder because I'm like. In like 1983, is it crazy to go to a concert where they're like projecting stuff on the walls? I think maybe it's probably a little pretty bit, nuts. right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, maybe that's, that's still like the like, most. Yeah, it exactly. feels modest. And they went today. through some lamps. Yeah, the totally. lamp budget on well, this thing is I in feel the hundreds. Like there was like that tradition of like the guys who would put like uh, colored uh, oil. You know what I mean? And project like oh, the, yes. yeah. the kaleidoscope. I love a, I love a kaleidoscope guy. Like yeah. An operator. <laughs> yeah. Who's that guy? But that was like a separate member of the band. Yeah. Right? This is our like spin art guy. I, was like, <laughs> I do miss that era. I, like I wish we'd grown up where we're like, see these colors? There's like five of them. You know what I mean? And people are like, that's pretty cool. That's I true. Look at that for an hour. Right. Well, I was watching this being like, fuck, this looks like it. Like this is the thing that makes it so f- it seems so fun to like be in a band and perform on stage one, like their chemistry with each other. And I was like, what would I be in the band? I'm like, I'm going to be the, the art guy. Yeah. And you're like, wait, you want to see some blue for this one? Bam. <laughs> Everyone in the back you're is the feeling You're the gels this. guy. Right. Yeah. yeah. We're taking requests. Orange! <laughs> <laughs> well, by all accounts, Demi went to see this show. Okay. And said, I, this makes sense to me. There's like an arc built into this. Right. I see the way it kind of plays like a story. Right. Um, and started playing out with them. He shot four or five different concerts. I think five, yeah. Right, because yeah, he didn't want the cameras to be obtrusive. Right. So he would shoot one night and it would just be back of the venue, wide shots only. Yeah. And then the next night he would only shoot one side of the stage. And the next night he would only shoot the other side of the stage. And the following night he would get like close ups or whatever, which is crazy because it does not feel stitched together. No, it really doesn't, no. which I think is just a note on how good the choreography is for a lot of this. But yes. Considering how even in the moments where it's clearly not choreographed, it goes from like wide to not wider. Like it just cuts between different angles and whatnot. And you're like, well, they're still doing these things. Like it's so, a lot of this film does feel like it's made in the editing in a very strange way yeah. where it's like, oh, he wants you to see this thing, but he knows that if he cuts to this different angle at this right time, you won't see that thing that just happened naturally on night number one. Right. So he's going to show you this other fun thing that's also happening on this side of the stage. And it's like so many of like the the other, like Bernie Worrell and yeah. Alex uh, Weir and Steve Skid, like all of the the members that sort of joined the band for yes. this performance mm-hmm. are clearly having the fucking time of their life. The, the so two backup it. singers, yeah. there's yeah. so many Lynn moments Mabry in Mabry. Edna Holtz. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, where he catches them. It's a shot that is like, you know, burn in the foreground ground sweating his eyes out and whatever and then you see still in focus over his shoulder the two of them and in the middle of singing backup they'll like look at each other and giggle yeah yeah Yeah. and it's like one of the only performance films i've ever seen that does capture that exuberance of so many performance films it's more like it's trying to communicate like this is fucking hard yeah sweating this out this is like they are like sort of men at work right like there's kind of that vibe and, and this is like right. Bernie Worrell, especially like he's just so happy. Yeah, and like, it's that difference between like, oh, this makes me wish I could be a rock star versus this makes me wish I was in a band. Yeah, because this movie makes being in a band look so satisfying. <laughs> like the chemistry and the energy being exchanged between everyone on yeah. that stage. It makes the collaboration aspect of performance seem like just the best thing in the world. Where it's like, yeah, you can perform, that's fun and whatnot, but like. There's one moment during Burning Down the House when uh, he and Al- – like David Byrne and Alex Weir start doing this like sort of just like weird like like running in place thing. And yeah. it feels so like both nat- – like I'm like I can't tell if it's natural or choreographed. But they're like both doing it and like beaming and it feels like David Byrne's not supposed to be smiling. But he's like I can't not. And they're right. just like strumming and like running in place and it's clearly just – it's one of those things that felt iconic to me like the first time I watched it even where I'm just kind of like, this is an incredible thing to see at a concert. Like it feels like 
they're having fun and just it's so electric like you feel that sort of like feeling of like doing something with, i think it's the, the also the same way i felt when like i started hearing this must be the place a lot where you're just like in a room where it comes on and everyone's just like it's fucking it's time and you're just hanging out with friends and it's like yeah. this is the most fun thing in the world and but it's that on a stage. I don't know. Right. Yeah, I mean, Byrne talks a lot about how, like, you know, I, I think when they started performing, they were sort of in more egghead mode. I mean, when they were in, like, the New York scene yeah. and they felt like they couldn't compete with these other bands that had obvious rock star energy or some sense of, like, aggression, like, a, badass a, a edginess. A root, a root tune. You're talking about yeah. a root tune. A root tune yes, and a sour exactly. lemon face. Right. Uh, but but then what he ended up embracing was sort of just his genuine feeling, right. you know? Because it, the thing that watching this kept reminding me of, and it's like the only other thing that seems to kind of capture this energy, the best film of the 2010s, which is Future Islands on David Letterman. Oh, yeah. Sure. This like perfect object that is just what's going on here. These people are jamming on something and feeling it so deeply mm-hmm. with so little self-awareness. Uh, the best performance on Letterman of the 2010s is when the Green Goblin guy sang his song. Remember a Freak that? Like Me. Yeah, Freak Like a freak Me. Freak like needs oh, we're forgetting Joaquin going on. Oh, yeah, great okay, these are the three best performances. Right, those yeah. are the top three. Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. Take your pick. Letterman kind of killed the 2010s. <laughs> well, especially because Letterman and all those is like, what's going on? Yeah. <laughs> like, he's just kind of like leading on his chin. But that's one of the things about the Future Island performances. Sure. He comes out at the end and goes like, whoa, yeah, yeah, Nelly. He, he like, whatever right, weird right. expression he uses. I'll never forget him asking, are those your drums? Yes. His two best Every jokes time. post-music performance are, are those your drums? <laughs> you know, picking any piece of equipment. Is that your xylophone? And also the, I'll take as much of that as you got. <laughs> and he goes, Paul, I'll take as much of that as they got. It's but, wild that Letterman is now basically on a constant press tour where he's like, I literally did that show 10 years too long. I know. Because, like, that's kind of true. And at the same time, it's like, I don't know. It's kind of weird having your – it was nice, like, a I grand old dad. Yeah, yeah right. It, it was so consistent, but it also felt like there was a time at which he stopped caring. And because of that, the show changed, but still was good in a way yeah. where it's like, right. It became this sort of very cynical show it's in like, a funny yeah, way. What are, what's your fucking thing? And you're like, I like this guy. Paul read on Hot Ones. I have just watched it. I have not seen it. Just Great watched episode. it. But he talks about eating Letterman. Eating big cauliflowers. I didn't realize Paul Rudd was a vegetarian. Yeah, yeah. He was eating, he was eating uh, big colleagues. Hot, hot sauce cauliflower. Yeah. Um, but uh, he said, like, it is the weird thing where there's the point you can tell that David Letterman's over it. Yeah. And the show weirdly becomes better and he becomes funny. Yeah. Occasionally, like, Regis would show up or whatever and Letterman would be like, you're a piece of shit. <laughs> <laughs> and Regis would be like, I know. Ha ha. And, like, and you'd be like, this is kind of edgy. Like, they're kind of knifing each other. They would yeah. do the bit where Regis would come dressed up as a character from a currently running Broadway musical. Mm-hmm. And Regis was like, I'm, I'm working with the show. I'm doing the bit. And right. Letterman would just be like, this is so fucking embarrassing. This is terrible. <laughs> Take that off. What are we doing? And there's the one night he came on dressed as Shrek from the musical. So he's in, like, two hours of makeup oh in the suit God. and Letterman just dunks on for 30 seconds and reaches is like I don't need this and he walks <laughs> off and it's one of the best things it's, it's just, just a genuinely pissed Regis Philbin in Shrek makeup going like I don't need to like, be here I'm doing you a favor 5am do you know I host a morning show uh, okay <laughs> since we're talking about Regis one of my favorite <laughs> Ramones appearances uh-huh. is uh, they go on Regis and Kathy, and Regis loves Dee Dee Ramone. <laughs> just look this up. He loves Dee Dee. He thinks he's so funny and cool. Like they just <laughs> connect in such a great way. It's amazing. That's wow. so great. I gotta watch that. I will queue up that. Uh... That, that that video is available if you Google Regis Dee Dee Ramone. Uh, <laughs> I just think that was a f- like. Because that era where it's like Letterman and mm-hmm. then you cut to Craig Ferguson who was basically playing – who I loved so much and yeah. I used to like watch every night. Big playing thing. to like a tiny audience doing weird bits and like – I don't know. No one gave a shit about that show. Right. So he was kind of just doing whatever he wanted. Like it's an underrated era. Well, it yeah. feels yeah. like Letterman grandfathered himself in as like this guy that everyone loved and depended on. So when he started doing whatever he wanted, it was just kind of like the audience going, well, I love this man. So I'll change – with." and it's like it. he basically like – 
Trojan horse himself as being like, I'm the late night guy that you love. And then right. he's just kind of, I'm fucking hate this. And he's like, well, you got to love me, but I'm still fucking over you this. You got to love right. that I hate this. Yeah. Yeah, because he created so much of the comedy vernacular, the right. modern comedy vernacular to begin with, yeah. Yeah. that everyone's contract with Letterman was like, I'll go where you're going. Right. Like, if you're a right. Letterman fan, he was always kind of uncharted territory in some way or another. Yeah. Um, anyway, that future Island thing. <laughs> Uh, there, there is that feeling, that thing that was like hard to bottle of like every movement this guy's making is so specific, yet it doesn't feel like anything someone would consciously choreograph. Yeah, and it is clearly like there's intentionality behind it, but it also just feels like he is somehow finding some physical expression of how this song makes him feel. Yeah, and David Byrne talks about that where he's like. People ask me if it's hard to get into the emotion of each song, and it's the opposite for me. Like if I'm singing a song, then I feel the emotions of it. Mm -hmm. It like very quickly unlocks for me, and my breakthrough in performing on stage was just not holding back. It was my – just letting my body do what the music made me feel. Right. And, uh, you know, I, I think with larger concepts like what if I'm in a big suit? What if I dance with a light? Like I obviously this stuff isn't improvised. Right. But I think it's honed out of him sort of uh, – organically finding yeah. the movement that matches each thing and then he would sort of perfect it. But it doesn't feel like – like you're saying, I mean it's like it's all very controlled but it also doesn't feel like, oh, this is a routine. Right. Yeah. It's playful. It's so playful. Yeah. It's such a hard balance to strike because it would be easy to be like, all right. You know, like I guess, right? Like that could – that's that's what he's fighting against. But like look at – like juxtaposition between this and Zoo TV – he ostensibly does do. I'll stick up for Zoo TV. God damn it! They called Salman Rushdie. It was it was hot shit. You know, come on, guys. He ostensibly does ten different characters in this. Uh, yes, right. Except yeah, they're yeah, very yeah. subtle shifts. Yeah. You know, when he goes into Once in a Lifetime and he puts on the glasses, he's kind of doing some like, like preacher characters, it's right? I mean, thing. he's sort of sermonizing yeah. the Clark Kent thing. And then you told me you watched this movie twice yesterday. Yeah, I did. Uh, I watched it in the morning, uh, had a great time, and then Joanna came home and I was like, I'm putting this on. You haven't seen it. I'm just going to put it on. And she's like tired. You know, she's you know, she's like, um, okay, whatever. And I'm like, it's just it's a concert movie. Like, you don't have to think about the plot or, you know, just I'm putting it on. And like three songs in, she's like, this is kind of it's kind of great. Like, yeah. you know, and I was just like visible. One, very happy. Two, very moved. I was just like, yeah, this is like so universally appealing. As, and it's, I could watch that movie every day. I'm trying to find where how you phrased it last night. You said, uh, I literally, uh, Griffin, I genuinely watched it twice today, literally just because I enjoy being happy and watching good things. <laughs> <laughs> like, why not? Yeah. Yeah. So I, after I, I watched it last night, uh, I woke up, I want to watch some of the special features. And then I was like, let me watch a little more of the movie again. So I restarted the movie again. And having recently watched it and then going back to the beginning, yeah. he is so sweaty, right? Yes. And he is so like – it does feel like he's been sermonizing for two hours. Mm. Like the shifts he's gone through by the end of the concert and then resetting back to the beginning when he comes out and is like his hair is parted in the middle. He looks like Buddy Holly. <laughs> he's doing this like weird like neck jutting thing. Yeah. You know, it feels so much more like consciously goofy. It's, but Ernest, it's, it's like he Ernest. goes through this whole character arc yeah. over the course of the movie. It's just funny to think of what I think of Talking Heads as a fairly cerebral cerebral band. That was weirdly hard to say. Mm -hmm. uh, and yet he is like Jonathan. basically like doing like Jim Carrey shit. Like he's like using the human body in a thousand funny ways, right? Yeah. And like – I, I don't know. I love that. I, I think I also – the very first song where he does Psycho Killer alone and has yes. like the recording of the 808. The, the, and right, the drum. It's also yeah, just like what a – like almost every concert movie ever starts with the person backstage getting ready to go on stage or yeah. the audience lining up or people right. getting their seats yeah. or some sort of preamble like that. And this is like, OK, you start on a white background but with some weird detail, some weird texture and the titles are happening over that. Cool font. Right. Great. Uh -oh. Men in black font. Yep. Really good title design. Love it. Awesome. Yeah. And then you realize that the white you've been looking at is actually the a beam yeah. of light on the black stage. Yeah. His shoes walking out, the crowd. It's already this weird disorienting thing of like you're watching a very intimate thing of just like a man's clean white sneakers mm -hmm. on a completely empty black stage yeah. with the audience applauding. Feels odd because he is bringing you in to such an intimate point. Right. 
not showing you the audience. He so rarely shows you the he audience. He doesn't really show you the audience until right at the end. And then it's like this joyous explosion of he keeps cutting to the audience. Yeah, right I, I love that so much. Yes. Just feeling like the audience is sort of invisible and all this stuff right. for certain moments where you can kind of see them like the back of their heads. Yes, through, like, right. But he doesn't dancing. do that thing where you're cutting to like someone just going like – No, until and right I love at the that because right, at the end it feels like there's this sort of – like mix of these people are exhausted but still like having the time of their lives and you can see like the different sh- like walks of life that everyone in the audience 100%. is from it's mostly so dorky that- white guys but yes yes but <laughs> I was like oh yep no this is what I thought the audience what would look like for but, I, yeah. but it's also like black women who are having the time of their lives totally. and there's this one yep. uh, shot of like a woman just like doing some weird moves and I was just kind of like this feels like I didn't expect to see that and then like right. the shot of the kid and then even right. like of the like sound guy sort of like hugging it out and like we did a good job but still kind of feeling music and i'm like yeah this is a exuberant expression of joy it feels Holy like shit. people were just at like a three-hour like river tent revival right. you know <laughs> like that's what's crazy about it the sound it, guys killed this like this sounds so good for live incredible. music it's yeah. crazy it sounds so good i have the uh live like this live album of stop being sense downloaded and i listen to it more often than, like any other album it's especially so because their yeah. version of uh what a day that was is one of my favorite Talking Heads songs, and yeah. I didn't know that it was like oh, just a thing he wrote for a movie or like a like some art project or something. Because I'm just like it's a incredible song, and yeah. it feels like a Talking Heads thing. But it's no, crazy. they just turn it into great. But that like that opening, which feels like a joke of him like placing the the boombox down yeah. and yeah. saying like I want to play a tape. The for only you. thing they faked. What that do you mean? Shot. Oh, that shot was shot yeah. later. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Ah. That was everything. Demi said he wanted to do some soundstage recreation stuff, and so they he could get specific pre- shots. They like they just literally couldn't figure out a way to shoot that opening shot live. Like right. they did. So like that's the only thing that's like done later. But, but they yes, shut down the rest of it because they were like, we're so much running off the energy of the audience. We're not going to be able to do it without a crowd there. Right. Yeah. Right. Like 100%. we're not like sort of that type of performer. Whereas, like, The Last Waltz has, like, half soundstage stuff because Squish says he wants to do, like, crazy camera movements. Even, like, Harry Nielsen or Nelson, whatever, uh, he did a really famous BBC uh, live concert mm-hmm. but had no audience. Well, right. He, I think it, for him, he just doesn't like performing live, yeah, right? He's the opposite. Yep. Yeah. He's, like, incredibly – he was self-conscious. Guys, yeah. what do you do – like, say you're David Byrne. Yeah. It's, like, 3 p.m., right? Uh-huh. You're going to go on stage at 8, right? Yeah. What do you do? Do you like eat bananas? Like what? I, I, the whole time, I just sort of get where I'm like, does he need to go to the bathroom? Like, is he I'm sleepy? I'm yelling, the suit must be bigger. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like, what's your routine before you do? Because I assume then you're done at 12. You're it's the most empty you've ever been. Right. He sits in a white room eating cottage cheese. That's yeah. what I envision. Right? Like, yeah. is that the vibe? Yeah. I imagine he's got some sort of like energy drip and he's like, if I don't move, like you are literally like recharging your batteries and then yeah. like. As soon as eight o'clock strikes, he gets up and walks out, and like, yeah, right. and there he's is like in full power. There's mode. that weird robot quality to David Byrne. Yeah, like something about him feels like very, very advanced AI, and part of it is the weird calm he has always. Yeah, but even his way of speaking sounds like Siri or something. You know, yeah. it's hard to imagine being like. Hey, I'm gonna go get some bagels. Like David, what do you want? And he'd be like, oh, "Can I get like a bacon, egg, and cheese?" Like you know, it just doesn't I'd like a bacon, egg, and cheese. Right. Like, yeah, right, yeah. exactly. Yeah. And I'd be like. Okay, sure. Uh-huh. Yeah, you're like, you like you sort of stop me in butter. my tracks, right? Yeah. I'd like a coffee with two sugars. Do they still do the shamrock shake? <laughs> <laughs> I love those rainbow bagels. Right, like there, there's that weird thing to where it's like you don't feel like I don't know. It's odd. You you feel like this guy needs to perform. Sure. Because this is all the stuff inside of him that he can't really express mm. otherwise. Otherwise, yeah. it's this very sort of still water. Hello, producer Rachel. Hello. How are you doing? I am so tired, David. Okay, well, if you're tired, you might want to tuck yourself into bed, right? Take a little nap. You spend a third of your life in sheets. Don't you want your sheets to be insanely comfortable? Yes, and mine are really awful. You got Have scratchy you seen my ones? Hair? They're so, so bad. <laughs> Have you seen my hair? Yeah, I've seen your hair. Oh, my God. Well, making your home beautiful, it's the ultimate form of self-care. This holiday season, why don't you give the ones you love or yourself something a little cozier? Bedding, loungewear, towels at Brooklinen. Towels? Towels. They got – Brooklinen's got the softest everything. Everything they sell, it's the softest version of that thing. So they got bedding. They got sheets, right? Very soft. They got towels. Very soft. They have clothes that I now wear. Very soft. Soft clothes. Oh, they must be really good loungewear if, like, they get you to wear clothes. Very soft. Yes. 
And luckily for you, Brooklyn is celebrating their days of gifting with daily promotions on different items. So uh, you can check it out every day and see what's on sale. Um, Brooklyn and they're longtime fans of the show. Uh, the first DTC betting company, they work directly with manufacturers and customers. There's no middlemen. So they're giving you really luxury products, but it's not too pricey. Towels, shower curtains, oh bath God. mats, and the ultra soft loungewear. I have multiple pairs. I'm a big fan. I like to lounge around in it because I, I like being in bed. I like being soft and comfortable, right? But what if I'm walking around in my house and I want to still feel like I'm in bed? Brooklyn's got it all. They've got their days of gifting, as I mentioned. They've got promotions on a different surprise item each day. And they're so confident in all their products that everything comes with a lifetime warranty. I love surprises. That's right. So the only way to get access to Brooklyn's days of gifting event and free shipping is to go to brooklinen.com. That's B-R-O-O-K-L-I-N-E-N.com. And if you're hearing this and it's after the holiday season, you can still use the promo code CHECK at brooklinen.com for 10% off and free shipping anytime. That's Brooklinen, everything you need to live your most comfortable life. Well, I hope my family is listening to this podcast and is getting this. <laughs> getting Brooklinen, hint. baby! When I was 11, for some reason, uh -huh. I owned the solo album Feelings by David Byrne. And I don't know if you guys know, of course, oh, the please. cover is, him, an, action is figure. an action figure. I know this cover very well for that reason. And my brain, thus, from young age, always sort of thought of him as like a weird sort of plastic man. That's, like, yeah. you know, yeah. that, that, that was his kind of, I you know. Often, con I mean, not anymore, but like for the longest time, I confused David Byrne and David Lynch, and I, mm. I, I feel like they same era, same yes. crowd in a weird sort of way. Yeah. Yeah. The same David cultural Lynch. soup, yeah. yeah. And then David Lynch doing music really fucked up the whole thing for me. <laughs> but like, they both have this sort of weird sense about them where I'm like, you are a very serious man, and your work is like enjoyed by all these like people who think of you as a very specific type of person. But then it's like they're weirdly goofy sometimes yeah. in a weird right. in a way that. Sometimes feels like disarming, but also just feels like, no, that's because they're geniuses in this like specific craft. And you like, it's no fun to be a genius if you're just like, I'm very serious about what I do. And Leave then, me alone. Don't and, look at me. And yeah. there's nothing like metropolitan or urban about either one of them, which is rare with artists yeah. like that, you know, especially very like heady, like fringy artists. But think about the medium that they're they're working in, whereas a visual art, it's you have to be so self-serious. Yeah. I think there's something about the fact that they came up as RISD students, yeah. but then put all that energy into music. Yes. But like pop, like pop music, right? But it's also – it's one of those things where you're like, well, of course their music was successful. You listen to it. Like anyone could jam on this. Right. But also it feels like – music that they never expected would cross over. You yeah. know, there is nothing strategic about these songs in terms of like... You know, it's weird that they were a huge deal. Yeah. If you just sort of like they're remove played any context. On classic classic rock radio. Yeah. 100%. Like right now. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. That's a weird band. They're weird. They're very they were weird. weird. Something about the, the tape thing at the beginning also makes it feel so intimate. Like this guy is sharing something private with you, you yeah. know? Which plays into his weird character of like the the blankness of David Byrne. It feels like he's showing you something that's a little too personal mm. and potentially a little bit embarrassing. Well, and a pl I mean, the vulnerability of walking out on a gigantic stage, sure. empty alone, right. is just is and, acoustically, and right, then acoustically. playing your first hit by yourself, by yourself, right? Yeah. right just and tapping your foot. Just that idea of, and he's so compelling, but like, it's right. Like people literally have nothing else to concentrate on right now. Mm -hmm. Like literally everyone is looking right at you right but now. But he's got that weird thing. I always think about, I, I forget who wrote it, but it was the New York Magazine review of You Don't Mess With the Zohan. And they're talking about how weird that movie is. And the last- That was Jerry Saltz, right? Or, probably. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah, it, it wasn't a film review. It was an art review. Um, <laughs> yeah, well, it's fucking art. So yeah. no, all right, let me maybe it was Edelstein. It. Uh, probably but but the final paragraph he I'll see if you can find it because I maybe don't want to paraphrase it, it was David Edelstein okay. and this is wow a long review go to the final paragraph uh, much to think about Dennis Dugan knows his way around shin whacking slapstick that's true mm -hmm. uh, and Sandler is mesmerizing some performers here we become go. stars because we can read them instantly right and I know what he's saying others like Sandler because we never tire of trying to get a fix on them. 
<laughs> we can only be sure that with Sandler's fan base, there will be many more mad narcissistic fantasies to come. That that has stuck in my craw for the last decade. That we we trying to get a fix on them is that yeah. David Byrne thing where some people become stars in any medium right. because there is a thing that is so clear and so accessible. Yes. And some people like Adam Sandler or David Byrne, the reason why he can totally captivate when he walks on stage with white tennis shoes and a guitar and sings his biggest song by himself acoustic is because you go, what's going on here? Yeah. I, mean, I, that- I can tell there's a lot and there's a lot of feeling to latch onto, but I can't decipher it and you it, never can. It's very interesting that you draw this comparison as well because – yeah. Obviously, this is sort of what Demi is seeing in Burn. Yeah. And then that's what Paul Thomas Anderson, Demi's greatest uh, sort of acolyte, yeah. is seeing in Adam Sandler. Yes. Uh, Which – that's his Trump movie Trump. that feels yeah. most like a Demi movie too. Yes. But but that mm, weird – right? Yeah, sure. That weird quality that some people just have, this ineffable thing of there's, there's a, a whole storm going on inside there. Yeah. And I can't crack it. Have I said my favorite joke from Murder Mystery on air? I told it to you, but I didn't say it on air, You can right? say it on Did air. Did you see Adam Sandler's Murder, Murder, Murder Mystery? I have not. I'm, I'm not going to watch Apparently, tonight. you're the only person on the globe because it was watched by – let me check this. I know. They greenlit Murder Mystery too. Four Murder gazillion Mysteries. Martians I, have watched it apparently. <laughs> it makes it hard for me to pitch my Murder Mystery ideas. All right. Well, um, here's – you think, but like, what if Columbo? What if we don't see? I mean, at the beginning. I mean, it was it was it was Columbo who did it. Oh, Columbo did. Columbo was the murderer. Yes. Oh, that's like where it's like no, a it's strip. nothing like. Okay, fine. Oh, okay, God, I'm sorry. It. We have to Put bleep that out. Down. We have to bleep that out to retire. Sorry, retire bit. Okay. Oh, at look. the end of Columbo, you see that he he his fr- his two friends become roommates, and it's perfect stranger. And one more thing, I'm guilty. Lock me up and throw away the key. <laughs> It was me. I did it. Throw it's me the in. knife. I did it. <laughs> um, no. At the, in um, Murder Mystery, uh-huh. Adam mm-hmm. Sandler plays an ordinary schlub from New Jersey who gets wrapped up in a murder mystery. Ooh. Um, good movie. Uh, or whatever. I, yeah. enjoyed, I enjoyed watching <laughs> it. I mean your big line was it is the, the first movie that you can – "Quote unquote," watch right. while never looking up from your phone exactly. and get every single detail. Exactly. There's not a joke. There's I'm not like, a plot movie, point. There's not an right. element you it don't is, miss. It is chemically it's a mystery. It is, who cares? <laughs> and one of the main you never have all, to look at the screen. all kinds of you know actors are playing the sort of colorful characters that maybe did the murder mystery, sure. murder, murder, did the murder in the mm-hmm. mystery. One of them is Luke Evans. Mm-hmm. That's a man, right? And. Throughout the movie, Gaston Sandler's himself. kind of obsessed with Luke Evans because he's like this masculine ideal. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, good-looking guy. Yeah. Right, exactly, exactly. And then late in the movie, Sandler's character is wearing Luke Evans' tuxedo, the character's tuxedo. <laughs> sure. I'm laughing in anticipation of this. <laughs> this is like at the end of the movie. It's the big showdown scene. Like he's in this tuxedo and they're like, where'd you get this tuxedo? He's like, ah, I got it from Luke Evans. You know, he doesn't say Luke Evans. <laughs> I wish he did. <laughs> I can't and, say like, and then he goes like, yeah, you know, it's a little loose in the crotch. I'm just kidding. He's got me beat. Got me beat. <laughs> so I'm just kidding. He's got me beat. It's so Tighten perfectly the crotch, worded. Not loose in the crotch. Yeah, 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 yeah. But, you know, but he try. He makes the dick joke and then immediately is like, "Nah, he's got me." Beat. <laughs> it's such good Sandler, where you're like, you know what? Sandler is only obsessed with how big everyone's penis yeah. is. Yeah, there are those weird right. For as much people say that like Sandler is like crass and obvious, right. There's weird subtext that always gets danced around with Sandler's persona. Because there's that that Apatow story too, where Apatow he kept saying Apatow, like, "Let me see your dick. Come on, I just want to see it." Which I he puts in funny it. people, right? Where he keeps and on then asking. Finally, to see one day, again. Apatow was at a urinal, and then he saw that, like Sandler was just next to the urinal looking. He was like, "All right, all right." <laughs> He's just looking at. It. He's like, "All right, what?" Yeah, yeah. Now I know it's a story. <laughs> hmm. uh, yes, so Adam Sandler is the David Byrne of our time. How did we first to this? say it? No, it, that, why why he's captivating as yes. one person alone on stage? It's right. the same thing as that Sandler thing, where like you're like, what's going on with this guy? Yeah. And there's, have you guys seen that uh, video? That's the like David Byrne interviews David Byrne, which was done to promote this. No. Uh, it, it, a, a must view. It is on the Blu-ray, but it's also on YouTube. And it's an incredible thing. But it was this weird promo video they made for Stop Making Sense. That is David Byrne being interviewed by a rotating group of characters played by David Byrne. Hmm. And it's full zoo TV, him in costume, him with voices. And he plays like an old southern man and a lady and all these different, you know, whatever. sounds a lot like zoo TV. It's very zoo TV, but his characters are very bizarre. And the bit is 
that it's not about the characters being weird. It's that he is constantly weirder than the characters. Yeah. So his answers, they go like, uh, David, uh, how did you come up with the giant suit? And he goes, well, I wanted to come up with a way to make my head look smaller and making my body bigger seemed like the best approach. Like everything is like these weirdly oblique sort of like overly glib answers sure. yeah. uh, delivered by a, a rubbit man. Um, but but there is that thing of just like you watch him play all these characters and you're like, oh, he like he had it in him. This like weird theatricality like totally removed from himself. I was just about to say it's so weird to imagine him playing characters because I, I just can't imagine him like even getting into a headspace of someone. But I guess it's also like is he constantly so blank that – He's able to like very easily be like, all right, I'm a different person. Is he Peter or Sellers? Right. Yeah. Because you watch him and he's like, he's not like a sketch comedian, but he like makes distinct different characters with different voices and different physicality. And you like believe each one is a separate person. Uh, but whatever he's doing on stage is just something that's kind of like unsolvable. Mm. And then, yeah, right. You go, you go from Psycho Killer to Heaven, right? Yeah. Which is when I just text you with tears in my eyes right. and, and say, like, I think this is the most perfect movie ever made. Right. I mean, the only reason – the only thing you could hold against this movie is if you don't like their music. If that was just a stumbling block to getting into the film. Sure. And even then even you'd, then be, you'd like, probably be like, I can't hey, this argue. Is really well done. This yeah. is the best anyone could direct a concert. Right. Um, but, but something about the Heaven number with bringing in Tina Weymouth – like the introduction of, oh, we're going to build the band one by one, really mm -hmm. spotlight each person. Mm -hmm. But also the fact that he has the backup singers harmonizing with him off stage. Yes. Not to be like a literal dummy about it, but there was something I found so emotional about it feeling like it is literally like the heavens singing with him. Sure. Mm. That they are unseen. It's spooky. It's spooky. Yeah. It's spooky. It is. It's these angelic voices. But also you're, you're – I feel like I'm paying attention to the bass. In in ways that like you know the baseline that yeah. like you, know, you might not if you're just watching a band perform right. right, and it's still like just like crushingly intimate just the two of them up there and it's a very um, naked and emotional song and it's it weird forces yeah. you to recognize that Tina is an amazing bass yep. player oh okay. and cool. so yeah. heaven is a place heaven. no sorry carry on place for nothing ever happens. ever happens I I also love that during that performance they start like setting up like they bring out like is it Jerry on the drums or Chris. I think Chris. Uh, Chris. It's they Chris bring on the Chris drums. on the yeah. drums, like yeah. on that platform, and like he chooses to sort of like let you see the stage hands like moving it, which in. I love. Right? Yeah, I love it so much, and I feel like it's such a. I keep thinking of it as a strange choice given the song and how like intimate that feels yeah. with just two people, but it's like. I don't know. It's weirdly cool to just have it be like this is an intimate performance, mm -hmm. but you should get the same experience that they're getting of like having this sort of almost interrupted by stage hands or like they yeah. cut away from that just to follow the stage hands and they're all in black. And I'm like, well, can you see them if you're in the audience? Or like, how does the lighting work? Right. But it's just all the, the fact that the, the stage is coming together as well as the band coming together, that mm -hmm. you start with it being just like a completely vacant, like warehousey space, the weird, like guts of a yeah. theater that you never see yeah. where you're like, Oh, it's just like a poorly painted brick wall and like ladders and stuff. And then you slowly like bring on the separate band members and you bring down the band backdrop you know I, you bring in the, the band the drum platform i love that when he walks out you can see all the marks you know yeah, for yeah. for what's gonna happen yeah. like there's this weird blueprint for like what's you know gonna happen whereas an audience member wouldn't get because i like the idea of a concert film that's giving you something a little different than what you would have experienced as an audience member. Yeah. This is a concert film that certainly makes you feel like you're at this concert. Yeah. Right. But it also, right, it has that kind of magic quality that it a lot of them you don't. feel like how it would feel to watch this concert, not what watching the right. concert looks like. Right. It is not didactic in terms of sort of like, like all those 3D concert documentaries we were talking about, which is just like get the cleanest coverage and you do it in 3D and it feels like you're there in the audience. Right. And this is giving you like intimacy – that replaces the energy you would feel from being in that room. Yeah. You know, he's making strong choices to try to capture in a sort of uh, subjective way the feeling of a live performance. Wait, and what do you and want all those captured moments of just the people jamming together, you know? Love it, love it. Feeling each other. Yeah. I mean, I was like thinking after sort of like looking and just like reminding myself of all these people's backgrounds, it's crazy to think. Once you get everyone on stage, the influence on culture of all of these people, yeah. mm -hmm. like Modern Lovers, Tom Tom Club, Bernie mm -hmm. Worrell, who we haven't talked about, organist, founding member of Parliament yeah. Funkadelic. Right. I mean, 
that is I mean it's just it's amazing to think of how much influence all of these different people have had. It's it's just great to see them then on stage together playing together. And it feels like they don't like maybe it's just because it's so early in not early in their career, but like it's so maybe not far enough that they just have like a jaded sense about who they are, like the music they make. But it does feel like that's why the moments where they like break and are smiling at each other. Like you see Jerry Harrison trying to play and like dance along with the backup singers. He's kind of off and you're like, this seems so fun and how like unpretentious and like just sort of like truly, I don't even know. It's like, it's, you can tell that they're the enjoyment they have for each other is real. And it's like, they're not just like, yeah, we're all just getting together. We're really good. We're going to do a job. It's like, we all fucking enjoy this still. And like are you know, truly experiencing it every it's night. It's like Voltron. Yes, it's, it's like, exactly it's like exactly Voltron. Like Noel Voltron. Gallagher, mm-hmm. to bring up Hot Ones again, was yeah. recently on Hot Ones. <laughs> great great well fucking appearance. Night. Noel yeah. Gallagher, one of the great people to give interviews. Mm-hmm. And he talks about how like – He has a great line where he says, uh, my youngest son who's either seven or nine. <laughs> <laughs> he's incredible. And Sean Evans goes, he's not eight. And he goes, definitely not. Well, maybe eight. <laughs> <laughs> and there's a bunch of things he talks about. One thing he talks about is like, you know, Sean Evans brings up the Nebworth concert, which is the this great very Sean famous, uh, you know, British concert where mm-hmm. Oasis played to like 130,000 people. And it's just yeah, insane. Yeah. And he's like, yeah, that was crazy. And also I remember, and this sounds like such an old man yells at cloud thing, but like no cell phones, like no one was holding up mm-hmm. a cell yeah. phone, which now is like this ubiquitous concert experience. Yeah. Uh, which you sort of think about with this too. But then the totally. other thing he brings up is like, right, I could have stayed with Oasis and like so many bands like that that have been doing it for a long time, we would have shown up, we'd have done the concert, we would have left and not talked to each other and gone our separate yeah, ways. No. And he's like, so many of the bands that are still touring, that's what they do. They don't hang out. Like they're not really friends anymore. Right. How could you be? Like, you know, it's so many years. And they all feel like friends in the talking heads. Mm-hmm. Totally. And and even though they like split up and everything, they seem to be on fairly good terms of the rare occasions they are together, and they never made an embarrassing album. Well, Tina what they did that is true. Tina Weymouth does talk about how she's like close with uh Chris and like, obviously Chris, Chris, to Chris. Yeah, yeah. yeah and Jerry, but says that like David Byrne is like incapable of friendship and like yeah, has sure. never loved them which it's like that's heartbreaking to hear it is yeah I mean it also it's not the most shocking thing in the world because he seems like a weird guy uh-huh. he's, he's yeah. yeah he's it, eating cottage cheese in a room somewhere right <laughs> as yeah. we speak he's I actually imagine- right over there I'm sorry I didn't mean yeah. to point him out I imagine him with like a coffee IV drip Mm, interesting. Okay, it's, uh, what, what should we talk about? Any time that David leaves the room, I want to talk about something we can't talk about with him here. What does he? What does he hate talking about? Oh God, what does he hate? He talking hates about? bits. He hates bits. He hates bits. He hates yeah. planes. Did you take a plane here? Uh, I, I did. S- well, I, mm, yes, but I saw you it's taking so some long. trains as well, right? Yeah. Okay. I took a plane, a train, and an automobile oh, just boy. to get in this damn room. You did the full Hughes. Mm-hmm. Full wow. Hughes. <laughs> Wow. A lot of people will do, you know, one or two, playing in an automobile. Yeah. No, I had to get a train in there. Almost took a boat. But? Wasn't feeling it. <laughs> sure. Just, I was oh, like, okay. it's the three. U2 sucks, right? We can just say that with David yeah. out of the room. U2 yeah, is one yeah, of the yeah, worst yeah. bands yeah. ever. Yeah. yeah. Right? I agree. I Come on. Like Man. Uh, this is a controversial. It was great. Oh, wait. Demi. Demi. Okay. No, you, okay. It's a retired bit. Okay. You haven't heard the episode yet, but it's a retired bit. We have to bleep that out. What is, what's the retired bit? I'm not going to say it because it's retired. Okay. I'm saying that was good. Demi. Ah. Oh, okay. Well, I'm sorry that I'm making a lot of work for you. He's by... too twisted. We have to. He's, okay. He's okay re- you don't want to. Look up there in the rafters. Yeah. You don't want to get a bullseye on your back. I don't. I get that. I don't want to get smacked in the face with a fish and the fish is wearing makeup. Fish is wearing makeup? <laughs> it's the kind of thing he would do. <laughs> He's not before he would do it again. He would fucking do that And I don't even sure. want to say who. Uh, I'll say it. I'm not afraid of him. Now I am. I was going to say it, and then I thought about the fish again, and I don't want to. You don't want to guess I'm I not feel like do that. Bono made people think, like, when celebrities take on, like, causes. Yeah. I feel like he made it where people were like, this dumb idiot with the sunglasses is trying to do something. I feel like there's something about the trajectory of people feeling like, Oh my god! I, I think like, it's oh yes. cool. Another Hollywood elite trying to you know help the world out. Uh, I think it's glasses. A, it's a double edged sword. Sunglasses. It's the sunglasses. Yeah, and the sanctimoniousness of it. And the I, iPods. Oh, how the dare iPod you? Thing. The iPod thing. The Deliver iPod thing. Your album. I didn't ask for it. Oh, that too. I just meant the fact that he's like uh, the bullseye. Well, yeah. No, it's a red iPod, and that's charity. Yeah. 
What, like, uh, remember when that was the thing where it's like, and now the iPod is in red, yeah. and y- y- the money is like, we'll give like one dollar to a charity. And it was the only other color for the first ten years of the iPod's existence. Yeah. Oh, if yeah. you wanted anything other than the white iPod, you had to be like, it's the Bono one. <laughs> you know, like, I kept on being like, aesthetically, I would want a non-white iPod. Yeah. But I don't want to put the money in it. I want the red one. I'm very fascinated. The, the article that was written... Uh, now I'm forgetting what outlet it was, but about you a couple months ago. Me? Yes. When you were talking about uh, leaving uh, Punch Up the Jam oh, the and ringer. going to New Zealand. Yes, the yeah. ringer piece, which is incredible. Thank you. Uh, I uh, wrote it. <laughs> about yourself. Uh, you're an even better writer than I thought you were. No, but, I, you know, uh, I, I have long been a fan of yours. Thank you. Uh, uh, yours. Our, our friendship has come out of me just being a massive fan of yours for, for years and years and years. Uh, I think you're one of the best uh, comedy brains on the planet, among other things. Um, But you, in that article, talked about this feeling of uh, unease in a way. Is that that fair to say? With like sort of this career you've made for yourself doing things that aren't what you thought you were ultimately working towards doing as much as you enjoy them. Yeah, I feel like it's sort of like I do so many different things and then get known as the – the blank guy and right. it's like that's not the fault of anyone and it's like obviously if someone was like familiar with my work through like Gilmore guys they'd be like it's the Gilmore guy guy right. right like it's not wrong in any way but then I start feeling like what if I'm not ever able to do the things that I set out to do what if and I, I get just, pegged one of the what if one of these sticks yeah and I become the novelty of that and not even necessarily that it's like one of these sticks and because of that I become this guy but it's just like what if I'm never able to do the things that I'm like, well, these are my goals. And then it's like, well, these things that I kind of do just for fun or because they like yeah. come up as ideas in my head are like the only thing I'm ever able to create. And they're like not super creatively fulfilling, although they are like very fun and often come out of me just being like, oh, that's funny. Or like having an idea that sticks in my head over and over and just like being like, I'm going to do it. And it's like, sometimes they also feel like distractions from like real work, like finishing something I'm supposed to be writing or like, sure. and I just kind of get the sense of like, these are so much easier for me than the things I feel like are my real goals and like the like outlet where I'm like, no, this is what I, when I've done it, I will be like, I am as like good or successful or whatever people want to call me as I like, as people want to say, but then I'm just kind of like, if these are easier and I only end up doing this, then what am I? Well, right. You're a person with very broad, creative aspirations yeah and i feel like if you're someone who has in your head the things that you've been like i want to do this someday i want to make a thing that feels like this or something with this kind of shape since you were like a child yeah you don't feel like you're doing what you were meant to be doing until you're doing that work right even if you are making a career for yourself or getting attention or getting positive notice for doing other things totally and even if you enjoy those things and they've been helpful in getting me closer and closer but i just keep being like i'm not doing the thing yet which is right. like such i think it's just a damaging way to think about anything but it's also like kind of I, I feel like also it doesn't help that i sort of get described in ways that like people who like are almost unanimously like hated on the internet or where it's like people are like this content creator like vine star and i'm just kind of like i but comedy musician I don't, right any of those yeah. things that are sort of reductive right well yeah because i mean i i became a fan of yours through vine and the thing that was so infectious about your stuff on vine was just like this feels like this guy's making it because he thinks it's funny mm. without any thought towards whether or not this will be funny to anyone else right. i'm not gonna lie to you it was all for the money. Okay, never mind. It was all for those secret, those sweet, sweet Vine dollars. But, so. it, but there was that sort of like – it felt like very earnest expression of like weird things you think to yourself that make yourself laugh. Yeah. Combined with always the knowledge of how much work you were putting into everything. That There was always a unnecessary amount of technical complication to any seven-minute video you did I that made like it funnier. that's always for me been like one of the things I'm like that's kind of the joke is right. like when people are just kind of like you have too much time on your hands. I'm like – yeah, <laughs> that's right. yeah. That's this is supposed, right. to, right. supposed to be like, why the fuck did he do this? Right. But even like anyway. the the succession song that you did, that's like your most recent at the time of our recording thing to sort of yeah. Like, two months from now, I got what, what's out this Christmas? Frozen. <laughs> I wrote sure. a Frozen musical that's not the one that you saw. A whole on Broadway. three hour musical. Yes. I got uh, what's what else is happening? Oh, you know, we Star Wars. Uh, what else we got no, going that's dumb. on? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Uh, wow. Spies, in disguise. Spies in Disguise. Spies in Disguise. You're going to do a Spies in Disguise. Oh, no, I can't. Old hat. Will Smith shit. Old hat. But I'm DJ Khaled is in care. the cast. I don't care. 
Old hat. He was in Aladdin, too. He's he's a bird, not a hat. I just want to make this clear. <laughs> old bird? <laughs> he's an old pigeon. Okay. Um, yeah. I, I just feel like uh, like this Succession video, for example, right? A lot of people, if they had that idea and know that Succession is on the tip of everyone's tongue right now, it's the it thing, yeah. would try to figure out how to put together the best quality production <laughs> so they could make it, like, in theory – uh, totally primed for virality, right? Yeah. We hired a good crew, and I spent twenty thousand dollars to do a two day shoot for a thing that might just f- fucking disappear on the internet. Yeah, and you do neither, which is you don't just record yourself singing and put it out there, but you don't spend too much money and too much energy doing it. You spend the weirdest amount of energy doing mm-hmm. it, which is each separate voice being in its own box yeah, as separate video and audio tracks. Well, for that, I had originally done it as like like one of my credits videos and been like, it had lyrics and then the Pusha T thing happened and I was just kind of like, what's yeah. another way to do yeah. this? And I, I'd been like singing that song just to my girlfriend and to friends for ages That's and they were so just kind of like, do something with this and I was like, yeah. I'll eventually do it. And then the finale was happening. I was like, I guess I gotta do it now before everyone's like, what the fuck is succession? And then I was just kind of like, I don't know. It's got this weird, like, feel like those acapella videos you see of people, like, f- like filming themselves singing. I was like, I just went to my balcony and just started recording it. Yeah. But, yeah. So, I mean, do you feel that conflict? I mean, I mean I'm trying to sort of, like, this is also sort of all the stuff we're talking about with the, the ineffable, like, power of the talking heads. Sure. Nice, nice segue. Thank you. Um, <laughs> but do you feel like there's the conflict of, like, when you have an idea like that? Mm-hmm. Do you go like, should I really do this one? Does it have to be something like really special for me to commit to doing it rather than trying to focus my time on writing my screenplay or whatever the bigger project is? So there are all – the thing that with me is like there's always something where I'm like, oh, that's funny and I'll like take notes on it. And if I keep coming back to it, I'm like, OK, shit, maybe I should do this. But then there are also times where it's like I've fully written a thing and then just been like, ah, the time has passed. Or like, ah, I really, like, it's irresponsible of me to, like, focus on this right now. Sure. So it's like, if I have something that, like, is an active project that I'm like, I need to be on a deadline for this, and I am I have this other idea, I'm just kind of like, ah, I guess it'll fall by the wayside. There's an entire uh, Lion King song I wrote as Donald Glover that I'm like, I just didn't put it out because I was like, well, it went away, and... Okay. Yeah, I, but I want to hear I that. I keep thinking, like, when's the DVD coming out? Maybe then. Right. But Ben went to the bathroom, so now we have to talk about something we can only talk about when Ben is gone. Oh, sure. Yeah. Did Guar you pull that one? is weird. It's so weird. War is weird. Fucking strange. They and Bono's d- Oh, wait. No, that's you. Yeah. God damn it. How can damn. you not like Bono? All my chips are on him. The iPods <laughs> were red? They were red for David, Africa? David, you fucked it up. Now Jonathan knows. Okay, well, that's what we talked about when you... And you know what? One thing I didn't say. Yep. Why don't they do the charity songs anymore with the superstars? Oh, you mean mm. like, do they know it's Christmas? Yeah. Like that? That would be fun. Like, get them all in a room, film it. I, yeah. One uh, of them's, like, trying too hard. One of them's <laughs> clearly hung over and has, like, sunglasses on. <laughs> one of them is, like, trying to get into every single shot. I mean, it seems like something DJ Khaled would organize now, right? right? That's, like, his job, connections. right? He's basically a wedding planner. Like, yeah. he, you know, he has, like, a clipboard. <laughs> he has everyone's phone number. He gets a producer credit on songs, and it's just kind of like, what'd you do? It's like, I put him in a group chat. Ex- yeah. yeah. <laughs> Right. Man, he yeah. is so good at threading people together in one he app. Right. This guy is a master of WhatsApp. Have That's you seen you. his Slack? <laughs> it is insane. Uh, there, here's the thing I want to go back to. What you were talking about. When you didn't have phones everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> uh, when we could just have a conversation with each other. You wanted to poke someone, you had to do it with your finger. Yeah, and the cops would look the other way. Yeah, when Zuckerberg it was a bird. wasn't giving you a thumbs up. Only tweet and you heard. Of a robin up in a tree. Yeah. Oh, back to Robin, are we? That's what he wanted to go back to, maybe. Yeah, maybe. Um, <laughs> I think that conversation was off mic. Yeah, whatever. It'll make no sense to people. <laughs> we were talking about Robin, okay? We lost track of everything. Yeah. Uh, this is what I wanted to say. Yeah. Uh, Jonathan, <laughs> uh, you were talking about. <laughs> yeah. I'm He's sorry. So good at the amazing the Jonathan. <laughs> the amazing Jonathan documentary. Yes, yes, that's my name. The amazing Jonathan <laughs> documentary, Sims. Uh, Wait, you, can I do something that I know uh, Ben will hate? Please. <laughs> oh, he won't like that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you were saying. <laughs> I I'm I'm I have a lot of respect for you for doing that. Uh, you were talking, David. Oh, God damn it! For fuck's sake, Jonathan. Yes, amazing Jonathan documentary Sims. You were talking about. <laughs> I can't wait to go to the bathroom when he gets back. <laughs> I'm not gonna. You were talking about how 
the the shift to concerts being that looks difficult. Sure, right, right, right. Where it's it like, becomes this is crazy. This right, is right. The, the one like upsmanship of feat. how much yeah. money are you spending on the thing? How many people are on stage? How much technology is there? How much physically how many, like, costume changes are there? Obviously, talking, you know, stop making sense as one of the most famous costume changes of all time, but it's just one. Yeah, right. just one. And yeah. otherwise, he's removing items of clothing because he's too hot. Well, there are times where it's like you see his hair like is suddenly slicked back. Yeah. And I, at first, I'm just kind of like, oh, is it because they shot across four different nights? And then it's like, no, these are like conscious decisions to be like, well, this is a different persona. Right. 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 He has yeah. the glasses that he puts on yeah. at one point. He has the red yes. hat. Yes. Uh, the, he's got the full – he straight up looks like Trump. Like, he does. It's crazy fucking... with the oversized <laughs> oh slacks God. and the it's red hat. It's hilarious to see now. It's so insane that Trump ruined red baseball caps. He, like, yeah. You never would have seen that coming. I was sitting on the subway on the way here and I was just kind of like, oh, red hat. And then I'm like – I was like, I got to get a look at the front i was like oh no some gold logo and i just felt weird about like why has he done this ben right. forwarded me this website that was selling reproductions of the production hats the crew hats for midnight run and i was like oh i want one of these and mm-hmm. i ordered the midnight run hat and it arrived and it is red with midnight run and white font and i just looked at it and i went oh i can never wear this sure. yeah. i can't i can't wear this even though it's like the graffiti logo i was like it's he's wearing a red hat with nothing on it yeah. That color of that hat is no ruin. He looks more like – well, is, does Ness have a red hat? No way to know. Anyway. Ness? Yeah. No, I, I think he blue. does. I'm is thinking, it blue or is I it red? Like, blue. Mm. I feel like it's a two-tone. It's red. Like, oh, oh, with a blue – yeah, oh. blue bill. Blue bill. That's what – I knew there was a blue bill. Yeah, that's yep. what keeps him from being a MAGA uh, stand. You know the other person who had a <laughs> this famous – This guy fucks. Oh, please. That is a child, <laughs> Jonathan. He fucks Jonathan. <laughs> Uh, oh boy! Is there anything less surprising and more on brand that Ness is my go-to in Smash Brothers? Oh God, it's so annoying. Because it's oh, like, oh, what if I was in this fight? <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> what about you, Demi? Do you play Smash Brothers? Oh, I do. Are you a uh, gamer? I'm a Toon Link man. Which is also, you're like, oh. yeah, that's not surprising. Makes oh. a ton Whoa, of sense. Toon Link. Yeah, because I'm because I'm tiny and I run around and go, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Got a lot of heart, though. Got a lot of heart. Got a lot of heart. At least three. I need them to live. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Who do you play as? Jonathan. Uh, uh, regular Link is a fave of mine. I like the Sword mm, Boys. Give me, give me a pit. You are a regular version of me. <laughs> yeah, I'd say. Right. Yeah, I have like a slightly more deep throated. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. I like. I like. I like Link. I like. I like Marth. Give me. Give me some Marth. Marth. Yeah, Marth. I Marth it up. Who's Marth? I don't He's know if I'm He's got a sword. He's one of like the Fire Emblem boys. Okay. We don't know. Hey, is Marth <laughs> the uh, – the, and then I love Roy. Yeah, Roy's Mar- another right, one. Right, right? Yeah, they're yeah, like, yeah. okay. The thing is I know that these are real characters. It just sounds like, insane. Yeah. <laughs> it sounds like I a love Roy. Roy rules. Ah, yeah. uh, Logan. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I went to school with Logan, and now he's in a game. It's so great to see his uh, camera. Lawrence Thompson. He's from the <laughs> HR department as Nintendo. You uh, can unlock him, and he just... It is weird when they started being like, I don't know, the Wii Fit trainer, and people are like, the what? And yeah. Like, yeah, yeah, like, yeah, yeah, sure. Okay. The Game yeah. & Watch stick figure? That could I be a character, that. right? But they were in early. I feel like they know, were in I the know, first... Yeah, Wii Fit's a funny one. They got weird with it early enough that they could be like, okay, well, you like that weird. So yeah. You can what handle if... literally anything. Yeah. Do you know I like Mega Man. I'm a Meg- I like Mega Man. Do you know what I'm waiting for in Smash Brothers? I want them to make the physical consoles playable. I want you to be able to play as an N64. Yeah, give me, and give the me N64 a virtual boy. just kind of waddles around <laughs> like can, Hogsworth. Like, give people epilepsy. Yeah. Oh, God. <laughs> My friend Pat, who will be on the show at some point. Sure. Uh, Pat May, one of the best people I know, one of the finest people I know. Uh, we did a road trip to Toronto and we went to a vintage video game store and he bought a virtual boy. Mm-hmm. And they were like, We have to warn you. People think this is a cute thing to do. Legally, (laughs) if you want to buy it, we cannot refuse to sell it to you, (laughs) but it will make you sick. Right. We don't want you to buy (laughs) this. And he was like, I got it. And they were like, we really advise – are you going to put it in the case? And he was like, no, I'm going to play it. And they're like, we really (laughs) don't don't play it. And then he proceeded to play it. In the car ride back, <laughs> the virtual boy, which has like a little C stand, is yes. supposed to be placed on a desk. Yeah. He put on his lap with headphones and was playing vehicle. it in the back of a moving vehicle. Did he barf? He's dead. How's <laughs> <laughs> it going to be on the pod? Yeah, uh, someday when we do a we'll seance episode. Exactly. Yeah. Right, right, right. Uh, no, he's a great man, and his brain is broken because he played virtual boy. In it the back is of just a crazy car. to imagine that Nintendo was like, "Okay, look, we spent a lot of money on this thing." And I was yeah. like, "Uh huh, games are cool." It's crazy. There's one issue. 
uh, if you play it at all, you throw up and have a headache. Yeah. Like, fuck, how do we get around? Like, they, 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 they wait all the way to making it, and then they were like, we can't get around this. It is the worst thing to do problem. There was more vetting at a vintage game store trying right. to buy a Virtual Boy 20 years later than uh, people have buying a gun in the United States of America. There was like, they need to improve paper, show responsibility. <laughs> it feels like there was a guy who was uh, in charge of, like, just checking the systems, and he got blind at one point. He's like, I can't lose this job. I'm not gonna t-. It's like, uh, it works great. I don't, it works great. I love the games. Perfect. Um, the, 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 the difficulty of concerts, right? People mm. need to do the sort of like one-up design. shit. Yes, yeah. yeah, but I remember when the, the Ashley Simpson thing happened on SNL. Sure. And a bunch of people came to their defense, to her defense, and said like, um, well, I mean, look, that's what the industry is now. Like people want these big concerts where someone does 18,000 costume changes sure. and they, they're flying on the stage. Right. So the last thing they can worry about is actually singing. It's, like, a, that's like, impossible. it's physically right. impossible right. to yeah. hit those notes yeah. when you're that out of breath right. and you're doing that much night after night. Right. So I'm sorry. This is what you've asked for. And now, of course, Ashley Simpson is going to lip sync even when she goes on SNL because that's what people get used to with a live performance. Yeah. And like this is like – this is – watching this film, you're like this is – why you would want to go see a concert. 100%. This is the this most is, a concert could be while still feeling truthful to the idea of seeing live music. This yeah. is when rock music was still mainstream music. Yeah. I would argue, I mean, obviously there is like some popular bands that I don't pay attention to that are out there, but I don't think there's like very many cool mainstream rock bands, I would argue. Greta Van Fleet. No, you know what I argue? <laughs> what? <laughs> I'm like, I'm like. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's a, a person and like, or what's, band. What's the three sisters? Heim. Heim. The uh, band I would uh, argue. Focus? <laughs> oh, that's what I meant. Yeah, yeah. The band I would argue just in type of thing. I'm not talking in terms of quality, although I do like them. But the band who I think comes closest to doing the type of thing Talking Heads used to do in terms of the energy of their concerts, mm-hmm. their actual size in terms of like uh, record sales and everything, and the sort of like conceptual aspect to their other – works is arcade fire like arcade fire yeah. does a little bit yeah. of that where it's like we're gonna perform at a church we're gonna do a music video that's interactive we're gonna do this we're gonna do that that dance album was pretty rough it's not very good oh yeah the new yeah that sucked and right, right. that was they released that single and everyone was like cool the new single- direction oh Rolled. this is fun and then the album came out and it, it blew was not good yeah i don't know what album you're talking about it's called I already forget everything it. now oh yes. yeah yes because yeah. you know we got everything now. Mm. But, the, but the song is called Chemistry. Wait, you're right? not into this? <laughs> mm. No. Uh, the, the, yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah. The, the single is good. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it is that thing, though, of like you're watching this man on stage, like mm. everything short of bleeding for you. By the sure. end of it, he is sweating so much, right? It does feel like someone just like performed an exorcism on him when you look at like the husk of his like tired body at the end of it. But it doesn't feel like he's doing that for the sake of – Look how hard he's working. It feels like he is just so committed to what he's doing. Yeah. That he it, he is feeling it so deeply, you know, that it's taking everything out of him. Uh, and I, I don't know. I just feel like it's gotten replaced by that other type of showmanship that is more, <clears throat> you know, how you like me now kind I, of. I feel like there are so many smaller bands who have to rely on the showmanship because they don't – or not – or not – Actually, yeah, the showmanship because they don't really have, like, the money to, like, put on, like, incredible performances yeah. with, like, technological set changes or whatever. And that's where so much of that energy lives. But it's also just, like, the crowd is giving you the same energy as the people on stage. So it's, right. like, I don't know. It just feels like this sort of feedback loop of, like, that's when they're still enjoying it. But then I, I wonder if, like, those bands, as they slowly get bigger, start to have to rely on other things where it's, like, oh, the – energy of that performance doesn't like no one gives a shit when you're like performing on i was gonna say leno and then i was like "Mm, let's pretend we're not 75 sure uh who's on tv now Uh, on logan paul you got right yeah on late night with uh jacob sartorius yes of course Uh, (laughs) and it's like i think that like they start thinking about what's more important in performance and how you have to like plan for it as a visual thing past just being in like this one room. And right. With this concert film, you can sort of feel that it's like they were caring about both, but in a way where they could kind of just focus on what works in the room and like just work on like the angles and how to like sort of make each thing feel different in a way that 
so they don't have to just go like, well, if this is going to be a visual medium, we got to think of it in a different way. And we got to have David Byrne like talking backstage about yeah, like the thing right. he's going to do or like show him getting That's into the so big great suit. that they don't explain. Now, anything. maybe uh, that type of I live performance, though, too, is it comes down to most people are seeing them on a big screen mm-hmm. yeah. because they're right. playing these huge the venues. venues. Right. So it's like it's got to have more than just a band playing music. Yeah. In order for you to stay engaged, because you're basically you just see ants. Yes. Yeah. So it's like it's got, there's got to be visuals, there's got to be gimmicks. Right. But when things get that complex, a they have to be so carefully and tightly worked out that they start to become a little uh, sort of hermetic. Yeah. You know, and like airless because it's very specific. The cables have to be in this moment at this whatever, and also people are going to be watching them on a giant screen, so you have to be hitting very specific marks for framing. Yeah. And that makes it so that any concert you were seeing in any city would 95% be the same. And any filmed performance of it would be 95% the same as watching any live performance. Yeah. And this feels like, despite it being stitched together from a couple different shows, this feels like you're watching something very unique being captured in a bottle, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah, right. that's... It feels like there is, like, sort of this through line of how the concert's supposed to go, and it's just kind of like... This is – we have things planned at every point, but there's like yeah. small moments where it like goes a little to the left and they lean back but like into the middle. And it's like those small moments where it just – I mean I've, I've said this like 20 times now, but like it just feels real and like they're enjoying each other's company that make it feel like this is why this documentary works so well. Totally. He words things differently in some of the songs. Yeah. And you can't tell if he's getting the words wrong or if he's just feeling different that yeah. night or whatever. It's yeah. It's strange. There's, there's – I forget one, but there's a line in heaven where he totally swaps out three words in a row. Sure. Yeah. Where he says blank check instead of heaven. He does. It was very much like the opening of this episode. Right. Just um, as good. He talked about yeah. Robin too. He did talk about Robin off mic. <laughs> <laughs> I keep thinking about uh, the Beyonce documentary Homecoming and how mm-hmm. like there's one moment that feels so impressive where uh, they cut between the nights and it's like so tightly choreographed that like everyone is in like yellow and they have this wide shot and they cut to the other night and they're all in pink mm-hmm. and you're just kind of like holy shit everything is like right on the money and it's right. like, that's so impressive but at the same time there is this sort of like realness and like sort of like relatability and enjoyment that you are missing from this performance because it's so clearly like right that's a more of like right this is right a perfectly choreographed it, it's not piece. a living yes. thing yeah, in yeah, the yeah. same no. way i mean that's what i texted david when it's I was, athletic like the beyonce right? it's you know it's like yeah. super like i'm not like trying to knock it or anything it's no. super impressive but i think like the lack of that is why so many concert films now will just have to be like we need like a backstage moment where you totally. can feel the realness and it's like the ones in the beyonce documentary don't feel more real but i I mean, we're never going to get that with Beyonce. We just kind of have to accept that. But it is just like it's still an impressive thing, but you can't like exchange it fully for the things that you get in a performance. That It almost just feels like they kind of were just like, oh, we're just happening happening to capture this concert. Yeah. Yeah. The the thing I texted uh, Amazing Jonathan documentary Sims last night. Uh, (laughs) Still Sims. Yeah, of course. Okay. Yes. Family name. No disrespect. Right. but when I was like, th- there's an argument for this being the most perfect movie ever made. Mm-hmm. I was like, it's just pure creativity. Right. Mm-hmm. Like you are just watching pure creativity and craft on stage. And you kind of can't argue with that. No. You know, there, there's nothing in it that you could find objectionable. Yeah, what kind there's of a nothing- jerk would you be if you're like – Eh, what's this thing with the glasses? What, right. is a nerd now? <laughs> right, like, I don't like that part. Everything's sort of just the right amount and also just ambiguous enough. Sure. That you can sort of find your own meaning in it, yeah. your own feeling in it. What's your guy's favorite bit, favorite song? Whatever. From this? From this, yeah. Mm, if you had to pick. I love in This Must Be the Place where he's dancing with the lamp. Like he That's has this weird too. smile where he's like falling over the lamp and then like picks it back up. Like he's like, yeah. I wasn't supposed to go that far. And then he's just like – Right. He, it like lands back in place and he's like, uh, is it going to – is it going to – I don't know. It's just so like – Anytime David Byrne smiles, I feel like it's this weird thing he's not supposed to do because he, again, just like he's been eating cottage cheese and had no emotions for years. Yeah. That like it's like, oh, he's real and it, right. It's just There's seen, a spontaneity to it, yeah. yeah. And also, you think of yourself and like, what if I was fucking around with a lamp? And, yeah. Like, you'd be like, yeah. Whoa! And That's also, definitely just the kind of thing that if I were had watched this when I was a kid, I'd do it in my living room and just shatter the fucking lamp. Right. He, in that video that's him interviewing oh. himself, one of the characters asks him, will, will you ever write a love song, David? And he goes like, I don't know. Love is pretty big. I tend to prefer songs about little things like animals or food or buildings 
I did write one love song though, but it's about a lamp, <laughs> and um, that's his explanation. I and yeah, well, that's cool. And yeah, I, I like just the idea of like you're watching a lamp dance, and yeah. a lamp is not a human thing, and it can't dance, and like that he's showing you like the sort of like. Mm, you ever seen any Pixar opening? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's true. I'm sorry. Yeah. You ever seen that brave little toaster? There's a lamp in that one. <laughs> yeah. Fucking lampist. Um, you know, right? Like that. He's he's bringing personality to mm-hmm. something inanimate, and and it, it does feel like. Like he's, you know, doing a Fred Astaire routine with a lamp. But that mm. thing also with like most They're sort like of like on the edge. I'm new- saying he wants to fuck the lamp. Of course. We yeah, all yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. A hot lamp. A hot lamp. Yeah. 2019. Uh, most like really sort of cutting new wave artists always incorporate things, very classical things from the past. Sure. So there's something about watching this new wave rocker sort of doing a Fred Astaire routine. Right, right. So sort of uh, earnestly And then on with stage. the big suit, he's being inspired by like ancient Japanese performance, right? Right. Well, you yeah. know, like uh, that, that, that that's, was on his mind right. when he's he was coming talking up with this story. He was the theatricality of Japanese theater and how big everything was right. and how he wanted to apply that to sort of all the weird emptiness of, like, American culture that their songs are about. It looks so, like, very, like, Klaus Nomi with the big shoulder totally. pads and whatnot, totally. too. And it's this incredible— It's got that weird like, expression. I mean, you can yeah. project so many metaphors onto the big suit, but, like, you write that idea of, like, sort of getting lost in superstardom and performance and, yeah. like, your, you know, on America. performance. Yeah, yeah, I think he's trying to talk about Trump's America uh-huh. and the clowns in Congress. Yes. And I think— uh, coming. Yeah, exactly. He, he's, you know, big uh, fashion or bigness in yeah, fashion, fashion was like a thing, here. I would say, like last year. I think but there was yeah, a few designers right where they were making those mm. giant ass puffy jackets. Lenny Kravitz with the scarf. Well, I mean, that's just <laughs> that's just a really cool look. Lenny Kravitz with his penis. Yeah. No, the thing yeah. about. <laughs> it's oversized. Saw, saw a guy in an inflatable Minions costume last year. Big. Fashion. Yeah. Big. Look. I love Minions. Be doo, be doo. Ben has decided that you know he's Ben has yeah. decided that he's now gonna get into minions. <laughs> With absolutely like sincere and uh, ironic appreciations Both. of minions. He announced to us that he's gonna start watching the movies and getting into minion memes. My dad is an earnest uh, fan of the minions. Of course, he's yes. always uh, dads love animated films more yeah. than they should but but is that mostly like does he like the minions on facebook or does he like the films or both oh the films okay i don't think he has facebook but okay. like i remember we went to universal studios and they had like the minions singing ymca he's like oh that's stewart singing ymca and i was just like <laughs> he knew you know which one voice? Voice? he didn't say minions he said that's stewart singing ymca your dad and Nick Weiger should host a Minion podcast. Oh, I my dad would hate the podcasting, but he's like, yeah, I'll talk to your friend about yeah. the Minions. Just tell him it's a series of phone calls that you're <laughs> yeah, recording. Right, you Once go. a week, you're going to talk to this guy for 45 minutes about Minions. <laughs> oh, and I get money? Yeah. Well, <laughs> well, but, well, we'll see about that. He will yeah. probably believe Weiger is his own age. I go, yes. this is a contemporary of yours. He is also a man who's settled gonna down. Cru- I'm going to have to like catfish him and be like, I need to hire like an older guy to like pretend to be Nick Weiger for I'll my dad. hold up a photo. Yeah. <laughs> Nick's voice will match that. Uh, uh, what a great podcast Ben produced. What's David, David, David Byrne? David Byrne? Is that what we're talking about? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Stop making sense. There's the this sort of meme now of like, oh, David Byrne predicted everything where people take elements from like his work or lyrics from songs or whatever. That line we said, our president's crazy. Her, right? Like how how could he know? Right, that line where he said hashtag dump Trump. He did say it, <laughs> and Let's he call said, him Trump. He said it early. He said that too. <laughs> um, maybe this should be your next concept album. It's just David Burns <laughs> about the Trump administration. <laughs> Um, I there was this interview I was trying to find again. I kept on finding other quotes like adjacent to it, but like from him in the eighties talking about technology. And the early days of like uh, computers and automation, mm-hmm. like he was freaked out by ATMs, sure, and was like, "I can see where this is going. People want to avoid interaction with other humans. Everything's going to be convenience." Right, which like he was pretty on the money about. But there's this one quote: on the "Money, ATMs. We should put him on the money. And we should. That'd be fine. It'd be weird. Yeah, it would be weird. It'd the be big like, boxy suit of all the people. I'm a six dollar bill." <laughs> Um, there's this one interview I found with him a a couple months ago that I couldn't find to to read today where he talked about how he perceived the future was going to be our personal information would be the ultimate currency Mm -hmm. that we would be given almost everything we wanted at great convenience if we were willing to give up 
some of our privacy. privacy yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and he just like he fucking hit it on the head. Now I'm just imagining someone being like, please, I, I'll show you my dick. Just give me the fucking. <laughs> <laughs> I just need two dollars off this coffee. On. I'll give you one ball. You want both balls? <laughs> yeah. And you go, fine, Adam Sandler. Here you go. <laughs> yeah. My All right. penis. All right. All right. Yeah. Yeah. I, okay. I know what you're working with. <laughs> I'll update the charts. All right. Yeah. yeah. Um, should we play the box office game? I think we should. Yeah. Are there right. any final thoughts? I mean, I hope this encourages you to watch some more Jonathan Demme films. I'll watch some more of this Jonathan Demme film. Okay. And then I'm going to move on to Philadelphia. I hear that's a fun one. Set in Philadelphia. <laughs> it is. is. Great city. Philadelphia set in Philadelphia? Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, shit. You guys mm-hmm. should have told me that. I, I, I don't know. I just – I was like, no. They – they're trying to get to Philadelphia. For sure. <laughs> right, yeah, it's a road to movie. Yeah. Right, yeah I know this yeah. is a stand-up joke that everyone made in the 90s, but it is kind of crazy that movie's called Philadelphia. Of course, right. Because it's like, like if you like made a cancer movie and called it New York. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's very, I don't There's know the why. There's the brotherly called... love thing. I think sure. that's the reasoning, and it is where it's set. But it's, yes. But it's also, It'd be weird if it wasn't right, set there. Right. It's Maybe not, there's just like they eat cream cheese at one point. Mm, like, mm, cheese although sticks, yeah. we recently learned on Doughboys, Philadelphia cream cheese not from Philadelphia. Sure. Where's Everything I know is a lie. I know. Where's it from? I, I think like in Delaware. I don't know. Jesus Christ. Somewhere. This is a sham. Yeah. Anyway, box office game. Oh, okay. Sure. Okay. So this movie came out on October, uh, as we already said, uh, 18th, 1984. The very day we're recording today. Yeah. <laughs> yes. 35 years ago. It uh, it opened in seven theaters. It made $40,000. It's going to go on to make a few million dollars, as you Ooh. say. But Yeah. Big success. Yeah. Ben's yawning. Sorry. Avatar level. Avatar levels. Right, right, right. Adjusted for inflation, this did make $700 million domestic? Uh, mm-hmm. That's right. Okay. Number one at the box office. And this is we're, this is a 1984 box office. So there are some movies here where I'm like, huh? Some real 84s. Wait, okay. this is October 94? October 84. 84. That's right. 1984 box office. <laughs> Sounds like an Orwellian nightmare. Oh. Oh. Do you know what I'm saying? I do. Not really. Um, Johnny. No. <laughs> Number one has been number one. This is its third week. Okay. It appears to be quite a hit. It's a comedy drama. Mm. Oh, not what I thought. Um, how to describe it? It's a profession. A, a the relative, title is a profession? Yes, a relatively normal profession, like a Ghostbusters. <laughs> No, no, not All that right. one. But ten comedy points. hundred <laughs> percent. No, the answer, of course, is Grapplands. No, <laughs> um, I've never seen this film. I know nothing about it except that it's about um, being this. <laughs> it's singular or plural. Having this job. It's plural. It plural. is plural. It's plural. So no definite article. It's called. No, like, it's an no. occupation that's uh, been mistreated for many years. Sure. Underpaid, uh, undervalued. Uh, oh, okay, uh, Did Jews. They make a movie in 1984. <laughs> What did you say? I said Jews. Also, <laughs> reti- he just said Jews. <laughs> Timmy had a good joke. I know, but it's retired. No. He's got to bleep it out. No, 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 ah, okay. Right, 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 right. He's too. He's King too, of comedy too twisted. Mm-hmm. Kind of the same joke. Yeah. Sure. Not uh, no. Mm. Uh, uh, t- tell me about the stars of this picture. We've got. Um, is it a wait? Is it a the? Nope. Okay. Nope. One it's word. A, it's plural. We've got one yeah. of these. I mean, at the time. I would imagine it's kind of young in his, you know, earlier in his career. Okay. A grizzled man now. You love doing an impression of him. You do a great impression Nolte. of him. Nolte. That's right. Okay. So it's a Nolte. Angels? Then we have um, a guy who, you know, y- you said Jews. He's a famous Jew. Really? <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> Big uh-huh. time. Yeah. Think about it. Dreyfus. No. <laughs> hmm. <laughs> In 1984. Big old Jew. Just I, a honking Jew. <laughs> He's still around. He's still booking Jew roles it's to this day. It's not Hoffman. That's Ellie Weasel? I don't know. <laughs> Gould? No, but now you're close. I'm in that yeah, sort yeah, of territory. Yeah. You're, in, you're in that sort of just like hairy character actor. I was going to say shoulder hair. Man. Yeah. Richard <laughs> Kind. <laughs> yeah, like uh, you're swerving. Come oh, on. It's, it's one of the kind Nolte comedies, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. No, come on, come on, come on. Now I want you to just get this Jew. <laughs> oh. Oh, oh, no. Why well. is that being isolated? <laughs> <laughs> I'm Jewish, to be clear. I was, uh, I was literally like, I need, I need someone to say that they're Jewish. I'm Jewish. Yes, we're, we're, Very there's Jewish. There's some Jews in here. Uh, uh, come on, come on. Okay. One of your favorite sitcoms he's in. Judd Hirsch. Hirsch. That's right. There you go, Judd Hirsch. 
Uh, so he's in it. Nolte. Chud and Nolte. Um, one of the uh, younger people in this in movie profession. is played by okay. Ralph Macchio. I, I, I must not know this movie. No, I no never show. respected the, the, <laughs> these people. Is the it called titles? Cops? Is the movie of the <laughs> teachers? Ah! There we go. Teachers. <laughs> it's a Ben's two least favorite groups. <laughs> cops and teachers. Yeah. Cops uh, are just teachers for the city, man. From the second Ben said that I knew I had a 50 50 chance right. of getting the title. Cops teachers. It's cops or teachers. Yeah, it's from Arthur Hiller, the yes. director of many movies. Is the poster like an apple with it's a an wick. apple with a wick that's right. sparking? I know it's gonna I know go off. Poster. If I made a movie called Teacher Cop, would you hate it a lot or kinda like it because it's both? What is he busting teachers? I haven't figured it out yet. I gotta, you know. No. Mm. If it was like a horror film in which that was the slasher, mm. then would probably love it because it would replicate his inner workings. No, well, I'm not saying I'm trying to murder anybody. No, I'm saying they were trying to murder you. Oh, okay. You would like you'd be like finally people understand how dangerous these cop teachers are. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Joe Beth Williams About time is the also cops in go after it. a white man for once. Uh, um, yeah. Commentary now. <laughs> Uh, and teachers? <laughs> uh, apparently Morgan Freeman in a minor role. A wow. young Morgan okay. Freeman. And it was number These one all three teachers. weeks in a row. Yeah. Wow. Made $27 million domestic. Okay. Number two uh, is the Best Actress I winner. I have no idea who was in that movie. I just Best, made the Nolte, yeah. Hmm? Okay. Best, Best act- Actress winner of the year. Sort of a, a, sort of a notorious Oscar win. Notorious. Because of the speech. My Cousin Vinny. <laughs> no. No. And it's, it's not Marley Matlin. No. Oh, wait. Sally Field? In... Uh, Norma Ray. That's the first one. What's Places the second the one? That's right. You really now, like me. That's what Sally is. Field, her first Oscar for Norma Ray, in my opinion, highly deserved. It's mm-hmm. a wonderful movie and she's incredible. In mm-hmm. And then her set, and then a few years later, she wins for Places in the Heart, which is it's a Robert of, Benson movie. It's sort of like a family drama set yeah. in the, what, Depression? Right. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. And that's when she goes on stage and she says, you really like me, you know. I didn't realize that was her second Oscar. Her second Oscar. That was the whole point where she was like, the first time I thought, okay, but this time now I realize you like Ah. me, you really like me. That was the sort of sentiment. You have proven your love to me by giving me the second Oscar, which is really truly the only way to prove your love to anyone. That's correct. Give two. Give them two. Okay, number three. And that box office so that was a weird. big box office hit. Yeah, yeah. solid, 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 solid hit. Can't be the teacher. That, no, that's true. <sighs> Number three is a movie. I'm Although gonna, Ben, tried. I'm gonna have to look up. I'm gonna have to look this one up. Let's. So see. you have no knowledge of what this is. It rings a very vague bell. Hmm. It's called now. This uh, is an occupation. Well, it's not technically occupation, yeah, but no. I do think it's very cool. Ben probably thinks this title is cool. Okay, Little it's women. illegal. <laughs> I think that's cool. I like little, <laughs> little stuff. Like, yeah. One, two they, like, inches? Miniature? <laughs> um, I'll give you the tagline. Okay. Ben thinks it's cool and it's illegal. Those are the and it's illegal? Got. Ben thinks it's cool and it's illegal. I'm going to actually and, have to zoom in to see okay, this. The thing. tagline. Wait, and it's an occupation? No. Oh. I mean, <laughs> it could be if you're good at it. Oh, He's, oh, right, here we go. Here we go. <laughs> Here's the tagline. Okay. He stole her diaries. Broke into her dreams and became her desires. Is there a movie based on El Scorcho? <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's a movie about a burglar who steals a diary and gets infatuated with the woman who's, like, who, whose diary it was and begins to like sort of stalk her. Is, to, is like, that fucking Phil Collins movie? No. Tarzan? <laughs> <laughs> There's a rom com starring Phil Collins this where he is, plays a burglar, and I'm forgetting what no it's called. This is no rom com. This is an erotic drama. Wow! It's produced by Bruckheimer and Simpson early in their wow. careers. Uh, I've never heard of it. It was nominated for a couple of Razzie Awards. It stars Stephen Bauer. I'm just going to give you the title. Yeah, give yeah. me the title. Thief of Hearts. Yeah, would never what? have gotten that. But it, <laughs> Not a bad title. Correct. It sounds like the kind of thing Ben would like. Ben just the flashed is, a peace sign. <laughs> I like that premise so much that I'm like, ooh, pretty good. I yeah. kind of want to watch that. But right. now I'm like, damn it. It's bad. I buy the it remake. sound right? great. Yeah. I will buy the remake. For buy the remake. So that is new this week. It made $3 million Hot this IP. week. Hot IP. Hot IP. Uh, number four. Mm-hmm. Now, I want to l- make sure about this. Yes. Okay. All right. So... It's based on a novel. Okay. Which and it was recently remade again as a miniseries. Recently. Recently. But this is right when the novels come out. It's got a big female star. Flowers in the attic? No. Mm. Uh good guess. Okay. Uh, this castle is a rock. Yeah, yeah. It's about a <laughs> castle on a rock. Yeah. No, it's like it's again, it's sort of like 
like Ben's saying, like Thief of Hearts, not actually an occupation, but sort of a title. Two Broke Girls? <laughs> Mm. Big fat liar. <laughs> Two Broke Girls was a long mini series. <laughs> that was long. intended as a mini Very long. <laughs> no, it's like <sighs> it's like describing what she is. I don't know how to do Okay, this. okay, wait. Oh, the well, sinner. It's a um These are all TV shows from now. It's a famous holiday song that's like, true like, like a uh that's true like a christian simply sort of, having a wonderful christmas you know, song <laughs> so it's a christmas song it this was a, a book george roy hill picture uh, an oscar winner at this point um, she was already she'd already won a famous lady yes Fonda? yes 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 no no think you of her think kookier I, mean, I am fond of her keaton diane diane uh but one of those diane keaton movies lost to memory i feel like and this is this a darker one for her? Or? Yes, yes, yes. This is like a serious sort of spy drama. Mm. It's a Diane Keaton spy thriller. These all you're describing them all in ways where I'm like, good movie. Sounds good. Apparently, according to Wikipedia, divided reviews. Uh, Klaus Kinski is apparently in this. What? Mm. Sounds cool. How big was the TV adaptation recently? Not that big, but pretty well reviewed. It was from like a cool foreign director. Seven seconds. <laughs> God damn it. You won't convince me that thing is real. All right. <laughs> it's seven pounds. All right. I'm going to give it to you. Okay. The Little Drummer, drummer Girl. girl. That's right. Ah. I did not know there was a previous film of that. did who, I. Who made the- Park Chan-wook. The yeah. uh, director of Old Fucking, Boy and yeah. lots of cool things. Aurelian Nightmare. Number five, and this is the only one you guys might get, okay. is a great comedy starring one of the great comedy stars that we all probably love. I know you love him. I guess as you might you might also love him. Mm. He's like a comedian. Airheads. <laughs> uh, you know the, the, the big comedy stars of the decade. This and, is, and, 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 and it's so, not so Ghostbusters. This, no, it's not Ghostbusters. Is, Ghostbusters is this, number eight. Is this person still alive? Yep. Okay, yep. so it's yep. not. Are they still making movies? I mean, he'll show up in a movie these days, but he's ramped down. I mean, his... It's his, not Steve Martin. It is Steve Martin. It is Steve Martin. It's oh, 1984. Uh, oh, no. It's is it Roxanne? No, that's later. Curly Sue. Mm. Curly Comedy. Sue. Is he not in that? That's uh, uh, Belouche. Mm. Okay. Sure. Steve Martin, 1984. The Jerk is 80 or 81. Sure. It's I not, love this movie. Don't you like Mr. this movie, I've never seen it. Ah, uh, you'd like it. It's not The Lonely Guy. Nope. Life? Nope. Is it All of Me? Correct. There we go. All of Me. Movie. All of Me is, tra- uh, yeah, uh, Lily, yeah Tomlin Ryan, Lily Tomlin dies and ends up in Steve Martin's body. Yes. Oh. And he has, he. he, he so it's like RIPD kind of. But he's he's got it's both inside. Very of him. much like R.I.P. It's mm. pretty much identical to R.I.P. <laughs> then, you know, I'll he won it. he won like the New York Film Critics Circle <laughs> Best Actor that you know yeah. like that was he, sort of like incredible people being like this is a great actor as yeah. well yeah. as like a great comic. It's incredible yes. performance. It's a pretty good movie. Sure. The performance is amazing. Yeah, I and, like and she's amazing too. Yeah. yeah, she rules. Yeah, yeah. So some other movies you got okay. the Razor's Edge, the <laughs> Wait, Bill Murray drama. Who is someone who would be like they're the kind of star where it's like I'll do it for like. An hour. Someone where it's like you can get rid of him early. Sure. Bruce Willis in Willis. Tiffany Haddish's body. Yeah. Right. right. So Tiffany Haddish just turns into a stone faced grump for half the movie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Tiffany Haddish just doesn't want to act Who for keeps the rest act, of the asking film. for more money and uh, a bigger trailer. Just keep saying, I, I've done enough takes. <laughs> you got what you need. <laughs> you want me to put on makeup to look like, he should put on makeup to look like me. Yeah. Uh, you've also got uh, Soldier's Story. Okay. Um, great. Uh, drama. You got Ghostbusters. So Ghostbusters is number eight and Razor's Edge is where? Six. Wow. So you got a lot of Murray. You got uh, this movie Purple Rain. Yeah. I don't know if you guys have heard of it. Because I think yeah. the, the, story, Prince. the story with Razor's Edge is that he had made it. No one wanted to release it. They wanted him for Ghostbusters. He agreed to do Ghostbusters if they released Razor's Edge. Sure. Right. And uh, Ghostbusters was still whooping ass. Sure. At this point, six months after its release. That's right. Ghostbusters uh, has been in theaters for 20 weeks and has made yeah. $211 million. Crazy. And it's, now, like, right, months in, the Bill Murray drama comes out and people are like, no, collective pass. Right. And Bill Murray runs away to France and doesn't make another movie for five years. Yeah. That's what you do. Weird guy. S- study at the Sorbonne. Uh, is Gremlin still up there? No, no Gremlin. Really? I wonder if Gremlin's got re-released for Christmas. Um, no, you've got the Karate Kid still in there. Oh, uh, Ninja um, Three. Oh, yeah, of which is Ninja uh, Three. Ninja Three, yeah. Ninja Three: The Domination. That's the right. uh, the third uh, Ninja film. Oh, oh yeah. Uh, yeah. That year you have um, you have that year's Best Picture winner Amadeus. Mm. Is, uh, is, and is, previously it was Ninja Two. Yeah. And 
I think it was Ninja, Ninja One. Like they I were calling Ninja, their shot. I think no, I think they, they said Ninja, Ninja One. I would yeah. love to make a movie with the title having a one and then just be like, "Fucking call me on my bluff, motherfucker." <laughs> That's uh, uh, Pokemon the first movie. Yeah. Oh yeah. Which was like a threat. <laughs> or, or Doug's first movie was the same oh, thing. Oh boy, that I'm, one didn't work that out. That was cool. Oh, oh, I'm, I'm gonna pitch Columbo season one. Yes. <laughs> <sighs> Yeah. David, you said earlier in this episode yes. that you had something you want to reveal about Zero Dark Thirty. Oh no, that was part. That was just a bad joke. I stumbled oh, sure, right. you were gonna saying pretend that, that I, yeah, yeah. Oh, that you hadn't seen it. Yeah, but well, that is actually funny because last time you were on, yes, Zero Dark Thirty was the only Bigelow movie. Yeah, you, you said you were going to be in town for these days. I said right. we're doing Bigelow. You said the only one I've seen is Zero Dark. I keep coming back to the pod for the only movie right. I've ever seen of a person's filmography. Yeah, yeah. Huh. yeah. So what should we do next? Um. Oh, I've only seen one Hugh Grant movie. Interesting. My favorite auteur. Wait, which is it? <laughs> he is. Yeah, he is. Too, too, of course. Is that the only That's film? The, I, I was looking through his filmography and I was just like, this is upsetting. That's crazy. You've literally never seen another Hugh Grant movie. Not one. Which is cr- also crazy because I'm like, I know him so Of course. Like, of course he's yeah. a, right. He is a type onto himself. I think that there's so many people who have like permeated the public consciousness that yeah. I'm just kind of like, well, I know them. And I just never – like there was a time up until – when did The Force Awakens come out? 2015? Yeah. yeah. I'd never seen a, another Star Wars movie before that. Wow. Um, yeah. I also just didn't get into movies until college. Sure. Mm-hmm. So I was just like, my parents didn't show me movies as a kid. I didn't have any. Other than Click. Well, yeah. Well, they didn't show me that. I saw the poster and I was like, well, this is the film I watch. Father, take me to the cinema. <laughs> and I left that theater a man. <laughs> Speaking of Sandler. That was yeah. your bar mitzvah. That was my bar mitzvah. <laughs> yeah. Not Jewish. Still got a dick cut that day. <laughs> <laughs> That's not how bar mitzvahs work. Hey, uh, buddy, let me cut I, your dick. As soon as I said it, I was like. Is anyone going to call me on this? No, I was like, everything I just said should be cut. Yeah, let, from this. let me uh, cut your penis, buddy. Not a, not a, not an intentional. Boy, I'd love to see Sandler make a mole movie. Oh, mole. No. Well, because uh, Zohan was the same thing where they wrote Zohan in like 97. And the studios were like, get the fuck out of here. What are you talking yeah, about? Yeah. And it took like 10 hits in a row for them to be like, Jesus Christ, make your <laughs> Middle East conflict hairdresser movie. <laughs> It that was a movie. hit, right? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it made $100 million. Mm. I don't think it made quite that. It but, made 100 uh, I'm looking it up. Because his 100 track record of Happy Madison comedies only got disrupted by Jack and Jill. Just made 100 yeah. right? That's they must so have funny. snuck that one But it over. made 100 Jack and Jill was the one that, like, slipped. Very quickly, could I just add to something? Um I don't know if you guys know, David Byrne is putting on a show. Yeah. Uh, yeah. American, American Utopia. Utopia. I really wanted yeah. to go and see it yeah. because, like, I was just like, well, I love David Byrne. And th- he's been doing the show for a while, and apparently it's great. And he, like, took it to festivals and whatnot. But just there's got to be something different about seeing it on Broadway yeah. that I'm like. But it's got a similar vibe to this. Like, they're really? all sort of wearing, like, uh, just gray suits. Yeah. They're not wearing shoes. It's like a 12-piece sort of, like, band. But they're moving around on stage. And it's, like, choreographed in ways where it's, like, they'll be all in a line and someone will step forward and someone will step backwards and then, like, move to this. It's all just, like, seems very theatrical. But that seems cool. Yeah. Wasn't Berkeley, he doing, yeah. like, um, what's it called? Not Color Force? Yeah, the oh, – I know what you're – Where it's, like, a, a flag – Sort of, it's like a not um, color guard, but yes, color guard. That's what it was. He was he, doing color guard shows. Yeah, right. He had a name for it that had color in it as well. And now I'm just, okay. I, yeah, but it was out of that I tradition. It was right? called contemporary color. That's it. There we go. But in this Vogue article, it's quoted here. It's it's part rock concert, part theatrical spectacle, and part intimate exploration of a major artist's career. Wow. So mm. I don't know. Can we say one? Check it out. One final thing about David Byrne. Man, has that guy worn? His hair going white well. Yeah. Oh. Like he it makes me want to lose all the color in my hair. Oh, I can't wait. Yep. Another thing that just makes the Ugh. fucking David Lynch thing harder. Totally. He's so hot. It's he's true. Hot. He's actually gotten more Lynchian, right? Yeah, because they both the have hair bad, swoop. Uh, yeah, the swoop. Yeah. 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 Damn it, DJ Weaver. Just, We're giving you back yeah. your name. Thank you. Yeah. I thought it was fine. Okay. <laughs> okay. That's I thought it was fine. Like yeah. It's we didn't need to comment on it. It was fine. Okay, fine. Kind of fine. Um, what, what, I don't know if you have anything you want to plug. You're you're in a, a transitional period. Yeah. In your, in uh, your by the time this career. comes out, I might have done nothing. Cool. Or? Or might have done something fucking wild. Great. This is coming out uh, December 8th. Yeah. To be yeah. clear. That's 
Mm, nothing notable to me. We should mention you did direct the Goldfinch, which should be out on I, most I, platforms. I like to, oh, I think okay, you're going to Alan Smith. I'll cut that out. Okay, sorry. Okay, okay, cut that out. You know, leave it in. No, cut I'm, that out. Okay. Right, I think right, it's right. time people know. Okay. Right. 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 Some other guys getting credit, and I just I don't know. Yeah, Goldfinch. You were the one behind the camera being more boring. No, no, boringer. I did. I did stop and say, Ansel, you are a little too captivating right now. I want you to fucking less I'm, engaging. I'm interested right now. Yeah. Not working for me. Less Let's juice. Do it again. <laughs> Take your foot off the pedal. <laughs> and somehow you like went into the editing room with a two hour cut, and you're like, "Can we stretch this out somehow?" You, yes. you, you beefed it up. It, it is the first movie that is just played at uh, half speed. <laughs> yeah, I did some reshoots, and we were kind of like, Mm-mm, "No, the people in this uh, test screening are still awake." Right, exactly. <laughs> it's experimental. I'm doing like a reverse Ang Lee. Yeah. Uh, so Goldfinch available now on Prime Video, probably. <laughs> sure. If you're um, lucky. Yeah. Jack Crackle. Yeah. Uh, you're the best in the biz. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, <laughs> Electro you are, you're the best. You are. You are. We always talk about, like, the, when, when the September video came out, uh, it came out w- when we were recording here. Yeah. And we just watched it. We went, like, he, he's the funniest person on the planet. Thank you. Truly. I, I've, I'll hit a cap with that at some point where I'm just like, I can't do any more. Uh, it's done. But sure. I don't know what that'll be. For the time being, I mean, uh, a- anytime you release anything, I, I am constantly uh, in awe of your brain. Well, thank you should you. put up. A- you should make it a theatrical experience. The September, Ooh. <laughs> a pop up shop where people come and experience me dancing around, and then another group of people comes in. And I'm just fucking tired by the end of the day. You should reach out to David Byrne. Oh, hey, I should. Maybe he's seen him. I could get a big suit. You huh? could get a big. You would wear You've a big suit. You've messed with suits well. before. I have messed for with suits those before. Those videos. Yeah. 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 I ended up in between two friends because uh, Zach Galifianakis had seen those videos. There you go. Oh, right. And he told me that he has talked to Maurice You show Bailey. up as one of the viral people in yeah. the beginning, yes. Or no, yes. I'm at the or, end or, as the DJ. Of course, I haven't of even course. seen the movie, so I'm just like, uh, of course. this is what people have told me. Yes, yes. You are his DJ at the when he gets his big time Hollywood talk show. Yeah. Yeah. So you can uh, – Watch that. What, is I, Tanya, still on Hulu? Sure. Watch that. A big I, Tanya fan. You really big, are the biggest eight I, Tanya times. Fan. Eight, I feel like in every, theaters or in total? I, I, you know, I, maybe four in theaters? We're, we're letterboxed friends. And yeah. I, well, every year you have like – you have the movie where you're like, yep, this is my year. It's Parasite for me this year. Well, good choice. Yeah. Great. But I also uh, – speaking of letterboxed, let's not – I don't – Danny, I'm not. I'm there's trying some mean to, people in your comments. Well, sure. I watch that I, happen. But I'm also just. I think a lot of people think of me as someone where it's like this guy knows movies. Sure. I I don't. I haven't seen any of the other Jonathan Demi movies. Sure. sure. I don't know a goddamn thing about anything. But you know what you like. I know what I like. Yeah. And I like I Tanya. <laughs> <laughs> I know what I like, and it's I. She does Tanya. three spins in the sky. That's ice right. skates. Thank you all for listening. Please remember to rate, review, subscribe. Thanks to Andrew Good for our social media. Lane Montgomery for our theme song, especially today. Uh, Joe Bowen and Pat Rounds for our artwork. Go to T Public for some nerdy shirts. Go to Patreon uh, where we're closing out. What are, are we coming up on that performance review? Uh, yeah, in a couple of days we're going to have – oh, swimming to Cambodia. Oh, perfect timing. With, uh, special guest Peter Newman. My father. Uh, Seriously, watch out for that one. It's an amazing episode. It's a barn burner. Yeah. Uh, and as always, I I like Lucy in the Sky. I haven't seen it. That's my completely fucked. That's up my crazy opinion. About, this year. Oh God, I gotta awful. have some crazy opinion think, about a movie. I this think year. it's I can't think of it. low key kind of good. <laughs>
Guys, just want you to know, I have a grenade. Oh, that was wow. a terrible five-minute digression. I want a little credit. <laughs> <laughs> I want a little credit. I'm a hero. Fair. Uh-huh. I'm a hero. I'm a very stable genius.